A clown and his snake child sit on the moon, looking down at Earth, far below. Dad? The snake asks, reaching a green clawed hand up to tug on his father's cape. Little bells jingle and the clown looks down, smiling a row of razor-sharp white teeth down at them. Yeah, squirt, the clown replies, squatting down to the little snake's level. The snake thing didn't have a name quite yet, sadly, as it was not his 13th birthday for another few minutes, but it did have a nickname. Little Cal. What's that? They asked, pointing a tiny claw at the earth, massive on the horizon. The clown stood back up, looking out over the planet, hundreds of thousands of miles away. That's Earth, he said simply. Some guys live there, I guess. Wow, little Cal said, crossing their arms. Can I go there someday? Nah, the clown shrugged a bit sadly. We're kind of stuck up here, kiddo. That's okay, the snake said cheerfully. Truth be told, they preferred to be alone with their clown dad. The snake sat down on the dusty surface of the moon, the ground settling lazily back down around where their hips had hit the floor. Little Cal was only about three feet tall, their face skeletal and gaunt, yet oddly sweet, cherubic. Their eyes were massive on their face, topped with sweet, pointed eyelashes, their mouth a jagged expanse of green teeth, cheekbones jutting dramatically from the sides of their mouth. On each cheek was a tiny spiral pattern, one lime green and one cherry red. They resembled a child's skeleton wearing a little polo shirt and a red bow tie, but with dark green skin and huge eyes. The clown, on the other hand, wasn't a snake person at all, but a gray-skinned alien, blood-orange horns jutting from his head, body wrapped in deep purple robes that resembled a jester's costume complete with pointy three-pronged hat, with bells on each end, and shoes with curled tips. An odd couple to find on the Earth's moon, to be sure. I like being alone, Cal confirmed, kicking their feet on the moon's dust. Do you, Dad? The clown put his hands on his hips. He laughed a bitter laugh, turning back to Cal. To Cal's alarm, their father looked rather despondent. Not really, he confessed. But I'm not alone with you around, champ. This relieved Cal, who stood back up hurriedly and hugged their father tightly. The clown gasped, but ultimately reached down to return the hug, hoisting Cal onto his poofy shoulder sleeve. Did you come from down there? Cal asked, once again pointing at the mass of earth on the horizon. The earth was in its waxing phase today, making its vibrant blue surface almost fully illuminated. Nope. I came from somewhere else the clown said, walking back towards their home. A planet on a whole nother reality. Whoa, Cal said, even though they didn't quite understand. That must be far. Will I ever go there? Someday, the clown said, but his voice wasn't cheerful or hopeful like Cal expected. It sounded frustrated, almost angry. In a way, you already have. Oh, Cal replied, a little confused. Cal's home was up a massive staircase, wrapping around a large stone obelisk that jutted from the moon's surface. It was the only structure on the moon's face, sitting near where the light side transitioned into the dark side. The clown carried his snake child all fifty feet up, panting as he reached the top. Even with the lower moon gravity, hauling a skeleton snake kid up a bunch of stairs wasn't easy. Whew, he said, sitting down for a moment. You're getting heavy there, kiddo. I'm getting bigger, like you said, Dad, Cal said cheerfully. Will I be as big as you someday? Bigger, the clown confirmed. But again, he sounded oddly forlorn. Cal frowned, scratching their red spiral cheek. It was a little itchy today. Is that cheek still bugging you? The clown asked, peering back across the roof of the massive obelisk towards the hatch. Down the hatch, they both knew, was their home. A small room inside the structure, outfitted with everything Cal loved. Computers, meat, candy, and above all, stories. Stories in every form. Books, movies, TV shows, laser discs, and grubs that when you squished them, 
told little tales in squeaky voices. Cal scratched their cheek again. They looked down onto the glossy surface of the obelisk roof to see their blurry reflection, frowning. How's your cheek? The clown repeated, sounding more firm. Cal snapped out of their trance and looked back at their father. It's itchy again, the cherub said. Which side? The red side. Cal scratched more insistently. The cheek was getting hot, too. Uncomfortably so. The clown stood, Cal's heart beginning to beat. Something felt strange today, different, like things were about to change. Is something happening to me? They asked their father, worry in their large eyes. Sure is, Cal. Clown Dad nodded, motioning for Cal to follow him down the hatch. Cal obliged, and the duo descended the long downward ladder into the home. But when Cal finally entered, their home was different. Something there was new. In the middle of the room was what looked like a slab, one half green and the other half red with a large divot in the middle. Lay there, the clown urged. His voice was soft and gentle now, parental and caring, secure. Cal suddenly felt more safe about the burning in their cheek and their father's odd mood, laying down in the divot in the slab. What's happening to me? Cal asked, voice cracking a little. You're growing up, sweetheart, the clown said. Cal found this rather vague, but comforting nonetheless. Hold still. The clown bustled about the room as Cal watched. First, Clown Dad took a large chain on one side of the room and brought it next to the slab. Then did the same for a chain on the opposite side. Attached to each chain was a shackle emblazoned with two different insignias. One, a coil of two snakes, at which Cal blushed, and on the other, the letter U with a line struck through it. The shackles were attached to each of Cal's ankles, but the one with the snakes felt looser and the clown had a harder time getting it to stay on. Am I going to turn into the Hulk? Is that why I have to be restrained? Asked Cal excitedly, a claw digging into the cheek to scratch it. Nah, nah, the clown laughed. You're already green enough, kid. The clown looked down, hands on his hips. He smiled, taking Cal's wrist and moving it away from their cheek. No scratching, squirt. Just hold still and lay down. Cal did as instructed, looking up at the ceiling of their room, eyes suddenly feeling droopy, a great fatigue setting in. As they fell asleep, the last thing they felt was the snake shackle coming loose once more, and Dad's hand on their cheek. I love you, Dad, they said quietly, before falling asleep. With the snake kid restrained, the clown took a long, deep sigh, running a hand through his hair, shedding his jester hat, slipping up and off his long orange horns. He watched as Cal's red cheek slowly faded into a light lime green to match their other one, just as their eyes flicked open again. Father, Cal's voice called out. It was different now, less sure of itself and more tentative, tinkling and musical. The clown approached, cupping Cal's cheek in his hand. Morning, Calliope, he said. How you feeling? Before his eyes, Cal had transformed, as he always knew they would. What's going on? Cal said, voice unsteady. I feel strange. Why am I empty? Cal raised a hand to their cheek, which once had been red, now both green. They looked up at their father, then to the shackle on their ankle. Who's Calliope? She asked, cocking her head. You are, sweet cheeks, said Gamzee, leaning on the slab. Remember? Calliope blinked, then nodded. Calliope, she repeated. That's me. I'm Calliope. I used to be little Cal, but now I'm Calliope, right? It seemed intuitive. Of course she was. She was someone new now, wasn't she? She knew that in her bones, in her very DNA. But she didn't know if she liked it. Father, what's going on? Calliope asked, a look of worry on her face. I explained it to you already, the clown said, stroking Calliope's hairless, smooth head. Someday, when you get old enough, you'll become two people. You were just Cal before, but now you're Calliope. And you're Calibor. For some reason, even though she knew her father was telling the truth, she shook her head. But I don't want to be someone I'm not, she insisted. 
You won't have to be, Father said gently. You're just Calliope. Someone else is Caliborn, but you both used to be Cal. Does that make sense? Calliope nodded, feeling tears sting her eyes. She threw herself into the clown's arms, sobbing suddenly, <laughs> unable to process her feelings in any other way. The clown smiled, unable to help feeling pride through his melancholy. They grow up so fast, he said, chuckling. But to the clown's shock, things changed jarringly, snapping him out of his musing. The snake shackle, still loose around of Calliope's ankle, snapped shut, the U shackle opening almost violently, Calliope's green spiral cheeks shifting in color to red. The clown squirmed, but he found Calliope's hug was tighter now, and her sobs had turned into peals of strange laughter. <laughs> uh, the clown tried to wriggle out of his child's grasp, but the kid was surprisingly strong. Caliborn? Is that you, buddy? The clown cried out as Caliborn abruptly sank his teeth into the clown's shoulder, hard. The clown howled, shoving Caliborn off as the small statured snake person cackled. <laughs> you lied to me, father, Caliborn said, his voice more harsh and brash than Calliope's quiet tones. I am the famous Hulk. Caliborn leapt from the slab, guffawing merrily as he wandered the room, taking a large book in his tiny green hands, beginning to smash everything in sight, splattering story grubs under it and snapping CDs and DVDs in half with glee. Hey! The clown sprang up in shock, grabbing Caliborn's little wrists. No smashing! Hulk, no smash, okay? What nonsense is that, Dad? Caliborn quirked a brow up at his father, sneering. Of course Hulk smash! That is his entire reason to be! Without smashing, he would simply be a very large Bruce Banner nerd! Caliborn jerked free of his dad's grasp and marched to the other side of the room to inflict more harm, but before he could, he tripped on the chain. What's this? He snarled angrily, tugging at the shackle around his ankle. Unhand me this instant, Dad! I want to smash the other side of the room! As Caliborn began to gnaw uselessly on his shackle, the clown sighed. You can't get to that side of the room, bud. It's your sister's. Sister? Caliborn spat the word up at the clown. Fuck that! I want to smash all of the room! <sighs> Look... The clown explained with patience beyond measure. This side of the room is yours. That side is hers, okay? My side. Caliborn nodded slowly. Yes, yes. How do I keep my so-called sister away from my precious side of the room? The clown picked up the open shackle off the ground, the one with the U on it. Before you go to sleep, put this bad boy on your other ankle. Then when she wakes up in your body, she won't be able to go on your side. Caliborn nodded raptly, turning the U-shackle over in his hands. Ugh, this is unfair, Dad, he said petulantly. I did not want a sister whatsoever. Take her away. I want my body to myself. I can't do that, champ, the clown shrugged. That's just how you are. Caliborn set down the book, hands on his own hips. Distracted from his train of thought, he wandered to the fridge and began gnawing on some of the frozen taffy within, turning back to his dad. I'm fucking starving! Bring me more food! Caliborn demanded, to which the clown chuckled, offering a sad smile to his son. As the clown climbed back up the ladder to the roof of the obelisk, he caught himself sniffling. He should be happy, shouldn't he? Not only was his son growing up, but he was raising the most important being in the universe, in all universes. Still, he felt impossibly, tragically sad, his body falling back onto the roof as soon as he was above, breathing slow and deep, letting melancholy wash over him. Below him, down the hatch, he could hear Caliborn laughing, the sound sending shivers up his clown spine. He looked up at the earth far above, reminded of another massive blue sphere he'd seen once upon a time, back when he was young himself, playing games with his friends. He tugged the phone from his pocket, still lying on his back, calling his boss. Gamzy! <laughs> came the voice from his speaker. 
It was a drawling, easy-going voice, yet businesslike and clipped. The voice of a wheeler and dealer. How is our little scamp? They're good, said the clown simply. Their uh, personalities finally manifested and shit. Excellent, the voice said. The clown had never seen his boss in person, but he got all of his orders from that voice, that irritating, saccharine, fake voice. It pissed him off, and he felt his teeth grind together. What happens now? The clown asked, watching Earth's clouds lazily drag across its blue waters high above him. Now, you wait, my dear jester. The voice paused. You attend to our young Caliborn's needs, and make sure everything is in place for his entry into the game. Beyond this, I don't really care. Can I... The clown trailed off. He swallowed. Can I go down to Earth? I know it ain't my home planet, but... Earth? The clown's boss cut him (laughs) off, laughing. It struck Gamzee how similar the boss and Caliborn sounded when they laughed. Cold and cruel. I can't let you go there, Gamzee. Oh, no, no. Come the fuck on, Doc, Gamzee said, voice cracking with desperation. I've, I've been good, haven't I? I haven't seen another person who wasn't green in sweeps. You have been good, Mr. Makara, Doc said, voice soothing. That is precisely why you cannot go down. What? Gamzee was lost. Because shortly, Earth is going to be utterly destroyed. (laughs) Doc laughed again, a cruel, indifferent laugh, like what he just said was the punchline to some polite socialite joke. Gamzee looked up once more, mouth agape. If you look up now, you may be able to see it soon, in fact, came Doc's voice. Even though he'd never been down to Earth, Gamzee couldn't help but feel sad. The spinning blue orb above him was so bright, friendly, lovely. Much better than the gray ball he'd grown up on. Gamzee just sighed, suddenly feeling quite tired. Oh, what's the matter, Mr. Makata? Doc asked, faux concern, lining his phony voice. I don't know, Gamzee said, unable to articulate his feelings. I feel homesick, I guess. My planet was broken, too. It was, Doc replied. But this is your home now, clown, so don't be homesick. Gamzee was silent, lying back down. Across the Earth's surface, he began to see red specks dot above the clouds. Far below, Caliborn cackled. In his ear, his boss hissed. High above, the Earth burned. I'd say now, dear Mr. Makara, Doc drawled, you'll never be homesick again. Now you're, uh... Doc searched for the right word, snorting. Home stuck. <laughs> the line clicked dead in Gamzee's ear, the echo of Doc's laughter mingling with Caliborn's far below. The clown, tears stinging behind his eyes, snorted. He felt his lungs squeeze, and a laugh left his throat. (laughs) Then another, then another, and with each tear that tore from his ducts, a laugh came with it. His voice raised to the heavens as he cackled and howled uproariously, mirthfully, tragically, wheezing and screaming laughter so loud it made his ears ring and his vocal flaps ache. It was too funny, too tragic, too overwhelming. He'd raised Cal the only way he knew how, with love, bottomless and heartfelt. And for his trouble, for his toil, for his work, he was repaid with a barren moon above a more barren planet. He sobbed and laughed and screamed and beat his fists against his skull, doubled over in pain and mirth as the absurdity of it set in. Below him was his own son, adopted from the heavens. Below was one of the only things he'd ever loved, and the only thing he'd ever truly hated. For even though his emotions tricked him and made his foolish mind believe that the little cherub was his own progeny, Caliborn would become the incarnation of wrath that broke every universe in paradox space. Below him was his son, the calamity that would end 
every world. This episode of Homestuck Alternate Universe was brought to you by Fruit Gushers. Fruit Gushers, the only snack that makes you feel like you're chomping down on a squishy insect. Available now wherever health hazards are sold. Now in industrial strength page thinner flavor. From Crocker Corp. Make sure to check out Crocker Corp Gaming's Spurb, the hit sensation that's sweeping every nation. Try it now. Obey. Consume. A young man stands in his bedroom. It just so happens that today, the 13th of April, 2009, is this young man's birthday. Though it was 18 years ago, when he was given life, it is only today he will truly become a man. Or at least, one would hope. What might the name of this young man be? Your name, of course, is John Egbert. A robust name. A plain, serviceable name. One given to you by your robust, plain, and serviceable father. A father who can be presently detected in the Egbert's home kitchen by both sound and scent. The unmistakable aura of baking. Perhaps a more run-of-the-mill boy-turned-man such as yourself would savor the sweet aroma of baked goods, but sadly, as fate would have it, the normally quite pleasant smell of birthday cake turns your poor stomach. You're presently seated on your bed, your body slouching, years of sitting at the computer desk having pounded your spine into submission. Your cropped raven hair is getting a bit long. It might be time to get a cut, as it is past your ears now. Even so, you always have the urge to keep it long for some reason. On your upper lip, the world's most pathetic mustache is currently growing, several long hairs protruding in all directions. The rest of your face is barren. Your build is normal for a healthy 18-year-old of 5'8", spare for some extra pounds obtained from a steady diet of your father's baking, which, again, you can smell wafting from below. As such, you remain confined between the four walls of your very familiar room, walls festooned with posters from your childhood, posters indicating a questionable film taste. Above your computer, the impish face of the alien from Mac and Me. Behind the calendar, tilted askew, a poster for Deep Impact, and of course, your crown jewel. Above the head of your bed, a massive poster for Con Air, Nick Cage's Cameron Poe simpering for the viewer, melting hearts and stealing resolves. Ah, <sighs> yes, Cameron Poe. Ne'er a better male boy role model, you figure silently as you gaze at Mr. Cage's face solemnly. Something about him is just so... masculine which is something that a young boy-turned-man like yourself would want to be. Ideally. You turn towards your computer desk. A magazine sits neglected underneath the keyboard, a copy of Game Bro Magazine, the latest issue and the last issue you will be sent by mail. Against all odds, perhaps just to procrastinate going downstairs, you lift the glossy pages and open them to a recent review of the upcoming Spurb, the first title published by the Betty Crocker Corporation's gaming division. You gaze under the page and read the recent review by esteemed journalist, Dude Bro Gaiman. Yo, Spurb is this game that a lot of cats seem hella pumped of. And this beta has been sitting on my desk for review, so I'm like, yeah man, I'll write something. But I don't know. I'm like, so this is about houses or some noise? That's fine. I'm sure that's some fucking dynamite in a handbag or some brosifs. But all I'm saying is, when do you get to thrash anything? While you're playing house or some shit, are you ever in jeopardy of getting mud on your doll's dress or whatever from busting out and I quote, the mad stunts all wicked up ins? Know what I'm saying, bro yo ma? I didn't actually play this game, but I give it 1.5 out of 5 hats to keep it real. You squint your eyes from behind your square shaped frames. So this Dorito encrusted dope didn't even bother to play a game? What a fraud! You doubt his real name is even Dude Bro Gaiman at all. You discard the magazine in the waste paper basket and sit down to your trusty computer, ideally to bother some of your friends, and perhaps, if you're lucky, rake in some much needed birthday attention. You open Pester Chum, an application that you and your friends use to communicate, surveying the land for any chums to pester. Drat. Only one name is illuminated as online in the chat client window, Turn Tech Godhead, with an unread message to boot. Guess your pal Dave is wishing you a good birthday. You recline in your seat, ready for another ordinary, normal birthday. Just how you like them. Johnny Boy.
I leap out of the cake dressed in a hot miniskirt. I begin singing the happy birthday song sumptuously, like a beshaded Marilyn Monroe. Happy birthday, Mr. President. Haha, <laughs> please don't do that. Okay, did you give my gift, big man? I think so. I haven't checked the mail quite yet. Tight, well, let me know. Big surprises are in store, my guy. Something for all of us to do before the school year ends. Nice. Thanks in advance, by the way. Unless it's a shitty joke gift. In that case, fuck you in advance. Come on, man, I'm not a prankster. You're the pranksmith among the both of us, Jono. Haha, <laughs> hell yes, dude. I'm gonna do so many hilarious gaffes, goofs, and spoofs on you once we're in college. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Lol. Oh, dude, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't really do anything too crazy. I'm just excited. Getting out of the house, living in a dorm instead of a shitty suburbs with my dumbass dad. I can't wait. Yeah, it's gonna be tight. Tight like a field mouse. I don't know what that means, but I agree. I guess dorm life isn't necessarily better. After all, we'll have roommates instead of parents. I guess you'd know about that living with your bro and whatnot. Yeah. Nah, he's definitely more like a dad than an older bro. He lays down the law. Would've been nice to get away from that. You mean it will be, right? <laughs> I'm so excited. I can't believe we all got into the same college. Haha, <laughs> yep. Sure did. I know Northern Illinois is closest for me and Rose since we're both north, but isn't it far from Texas? John, John O'Man, Big Funky J. It's always college talk with you, my dude. We gotta live in the now, you feel? We've got to take life by the scrotum and twist until life's horrible juices leak out. When life gives you scrotum, make scrotum aid. Haha, <laughs> gross. But, uh, yeah, bro's calling me, so just let me know when you secure the goods, champ. Okay, see you, Dave. It was very sweet of Dave to get you a year-long subscription to GameBro for your birthday last year, but you don't have the heart to tell him you haven't read a single issue, outside of a Tomb Raider review that you uh, just opened to get a peek at Laura Croft in uh, next-gen graphics. T totally wholesome, you swear. Still, you hope Dave's surprise isn't yet another subscription. You peek out the window, which gives you a view of your driveway, near which a mailbox sits gently. Mr. Henderson across the street mows his lawn lazily. Mrs. Gunther glares daggers at him from next door for the noise of his mower. The sun shines down on the lot, a cloud swimming across the baby blue sky. A normal day. Once you snap out of your trance, you look back to the mailbox. The flag is up, and it makes your heart thud. A thudding which is brought to a halt, as you realize that to access the newly arrived mail, you'll have to pass your father in the kitchen. Fuck. There's nothing for it. You've spent all the time up in your room that you can stand. You open your bedroom door, and no sooner have you crossed the threshold than your father's voice booms from downstairs. Johnny boy! He calls jovially. You cringe. You don't get his whole model father shtick. He's not a bad dad or anything, but the way he sucks on a pipe and speaks in that stentorian voice for every passing comment makes you wince with secondhand embarrassment. You'll be happy to be in a college dorm soon. Yeah, Pops? You return tentatively, hoping he just heard you come out and simply wanted to greet you quickly. No such luck. Come on down to the kitchen! I hear it's a big day for a special guy! God, you feel like you're 12 again. An age where you already started to resent your father's fatherliness. Oh, uh... You hastily try to grasp at an excuse. I'm just checking the mail for presents for my friends. Uh, I'll be there in a sec. Nonsense, my boy, your father insists. Brick-a-brack from your internet buddies can wait. Your dad is bad at taking no for an answer. Worse, when he's pushy, he's always at his most saccharine. It's a politeness trap that he lays with exceptional finesse. You relent, entering the warm kitchen to the smell of baked sweets and your father's equally warm, sweet grin. There he is! Before you can squawk a protest, your father grabs you under his arm and drills a knuckle into your skull. Ah, the famous Noogie. How many of these have you suffered in all your life? Too many to count. Too many to enjoy one more. Hi, Dad, you say half-heartedly, squirming out of his grasp. My God, you're an entire adult now, boy, he says, clapping you on the back rather hard. You wince, not just because of the pain. They grow up so fast. It's hard for me to imagine a handsome guy like yourself getting abandoned at birth. You roll your eyes. You make it sound like a movie, you grumble. 
I wasn't some doorstep baby. I was just abandoned somewhere. Your dad turns away, opening the oven. A wash of heat enveloping the room. Let's not talk about that, eh, champ? He says awkwardly, even though he brought it up. You've known you were adopted for a long time, but your dad doesn't like to talk about it. It strikes you as odd that he has more trouble coping with your adoptedness than you do. Right, you agree. It's not like you want to talk about your mysterious babyhood circumstances either at the moment. You furtively glance at the kitchen door, already planning your escape. So, he says, readjusting the conversation. Those uh, interzone fellows you consort with sent you... Dad hesitates. Gifts? Yeah. Your disposition lifts a little as your dad sets out a tray of cookies to cool, which you try to stifle your disgust towards. Dad's cooking isn't bad. The opposite, actually. You come from a long line of bakers, your father learning every trick from your dear departed Nana. No, your distaste comes from having to eat the things for 18 fucking years straight. Y you know, they wanted to celebrate too, so... Before you can continue, Dad cuts you off. Uh, he pauses. So you gave them our address? He crosses his arms, staring down at you in that classic, not mad, just disappointed way. You swallow. Well, yeah, you know, to, uh, nowhere to send gifts? Uh, I've sent them stuff before, so... strangers our address. Your dad cuts you off once again. He takes off the oven mitt, patting it against his palm. I... God, you feel like you're 12 for the second time today. This time, though, you've just knocked over Nana's urn, and Dad is about to give you a stern talking to. But you're not 12 anymore. Like he said, you're an adult. You push back. They're not strangers, Dad. I've explained... Oh, come on, sport. How well do you really know these yahoos? Dad, as usual, barely allows you to speak. Once you're on the defensive with him, you're in for a lecture for certain. Don't give out your personal info online, kiddo. That's World Wide Web 101. Your fist clenches and your jaw sets. Will Smith was right, you decide. Parents just don't understand. It's fine. They're not going to mail us bombs, Dad. Fuck. You cross your arms, your surly, rebellious teen side coming out in full force. Hey, hey he says. Watch the language. That appears to have distracted him from the point, and he withdraws a pipette from the drawer. Just scram. We'll talk about web line safety later. I've got a certain birthday boy's cake to make pretty. You sigh with relief, slinking away, though you still feel sullen. You and your father's relationship is full of strife, but you can't help but love the guy. He's a single father by choice, accepting the responsibility of a son, even though he never had a spouse of his own. He might be the most irritating man in the world, but he's your dad, and he loves you. If only he wouldn't make you feel like a child. You exit the kitchen door towards the driveway's end, rubbing your hands together as you pull the mailbox open to reveal, yes, two packages. One is small and purple, and the other is a plain brown envelope, haphazardly posted. The former is from your friend Rose, and the other from Dave, aka Turntech Godhead. With your spoils, you head inside and place the remaining mail on the coffee table for your dad to peruse later on. You pause in the living room, quirking a brow. It appears that dad has lit a fire in the fireplace, in front of which is a massive oversized gift box. Hey, your dad says, poking his head out of the kitchen. No touching that box yet. Looks like he wants to save it for later. You approach the fireplace, looking above it to see the smiling face of your nana, framed in a lovely photo, under which is an urn containing her remains. You think it's a bit macabre to keep ashes around the house, but you can't deny that you like having your nana's photo here. You don't remember her very well. She passed away when you were young, but all the memories you have of her are warm and kind, something that makes you nostalgic, like there's a kinship between you that can't be explained. For now, you rush upstairs to report the present status. To your delight, you see another chum is online, Rose Lalonde. Her purple text underlines her royal speaking style, but you know deep down that she isn't as haughty as she thinks. John, a happy birthday to you. You are now of legal age. Yeah, I guess I can, like, have sexual intercourse now, huh? I was referring to the legal age in terms of being tried as an adult on criminal charges. But yes, sex is a perk. I would know. Naturally from fucking your mother. Joke's on you, Lalonde. I don't even have a mother. Precisely. She was erased from existence retroactively due to the caliber of the sex I had with her. Haven't you ever thought how strange your circumstances are? 
Raised by a single father without a mom in sight in all your 18 years. <gasps> That's right, Egbert. I quantum fucked your mom. Wow, I'm getting the deluxe Roseburn experience. Happy birthday to me. Indeed. Motherfucking aside, have you obtained my gifts? I must admit I'm rather excited to get your reaction to them, as it was quite a feat to arrange. Yeah, I haven't opened the package yet, though. Do so post-haste. You won't regret it. Furthermore, have you obtained Dave's gift? His gift also has implications for myself as well. Ooh, cryptic. I haven't opened anything yet. No rush. Though one wonders why you don't just open them already, instead of wasting time talking to a spinster like me. Right, an 18-year-old spinster. Truly a life of solitude. I roll. But you're right, Rose, it is my birthday. I'm the birthday person. The birthday person? Uh, yeah, that's what I said. Lol. The birthday person. Indeed. <sighs> you say indeed whenever you're about to say something weird. I don't. You do. You're about to make some insane claim or something. Little Miss Freud. I was just going to comment on how odd it is. You refer to yourself as the birthday person. Well, I am. You are. But birthday boy is a shorter phrase. Easier to type, yet you, in spite of your excitement, typed person. Birthday boy is a tried and true alliterative phrase used in English-speaking countries across the world over to denote male birthdays. But you chose birthday person. Perhaps we should discuss this? No. No, Rose, stop. I just think it's interesting. Rose, don't bring this up again, please. What am I bringing up? You're being defensive, birthday personage. Fine, I'm the birthday boy. Happy? You're so weird about this. Have you had your dream lately, John? Oh, my fucking god. I'm so sorry I ever told you about that stupid dream. It's a significant dream, John. We should discuss it sometime. It was one dream! I'm just curious why your dreams always seem to feature you in a woman's body. It has implications that could be corroborated with this insistence on the term birthday person. Nope! I'm gonna open my presents now, Rose. Bye! As always after speaking with Rose, you feel a bit frazzled. You both have a long history of friendly needling, and you know she doesn't mean anything malicious by her lighthearted antagonism, but something about her words today I feel uniquely discomforting. You shake your head, staring at the words birthday person on screen that you'd typed. No time for introspection, it's your birthday. And person or boy, you've got presents to cash in on. You decide to open Rose's gift first. It's not gift wrapped, but a package is a package, and it inspires the giddy glee that any other birthday gift would. You tear the bitch open, and within is... a grubby looking rabbit doll? You lift it from the box, blinking in confusion before noticing a small leaflet underneath. You pick it up, and your eyes go wide with shock. Certificate of Authenticity. This stuffed rabbit was the prop used in Con Air, 1997, Nick Cage, Simon West. Your hands shudder, your body racked with soft, mushy gratitude. You immediately forget you and Rose's earlier conversation, typing with delicate keystrokes, tears stinging the back of your eyes. Rose, holy fuck, I, I don't know what to say. I assume this is about the gift and not about me fucking your mother. The real bunny? You got me the real Con Air rabbit. God, this must have cost a fortune. It didn't. Your taste in bad movies allowed me to net cheap memorabilia. It was $20 on eBay, John. Still, it is one of a kind. The price doesn't matter. Even though that's total bullshit, this thing is a relic, an artifact. It's perfect. I love it. You're welcome, John. I'm happy you like the dirty rabbit. Underplay it all you want, Rose. You did a nice, thoughtful thing. And now you have to deal with the consequences. Ah, my grim, dark mind, recoiling from happiness and gratitude. You must stop before I shrivel up like the evil little raisin I am. <laughs> Thanks, Rose. It gives me great pain to speak these words, John, but you're welcome. In other matters, have you opened Dave's gift yet? Oh, yeah. I'm waiting for him to be online. That could be a while. He said to me that he had to deal with his brother. You know how that goes. Hmm. Rose is right. No use waiting around all day for Dave to be around. Better open his gift, too. You really wonder what the surprise is. 
Inside of the haphazard envelope is a much more self-evident gift, a copy of Spurb. You grin. You know this game is on the cutting edge, and Dave buying it for you was really sweet of him. You look at the front of the box. On the cover is a very simple graphic, a greenhouse with four segments like a window pane, with a smaller box cut out of the top right square. Above this insignia, the game's title in stylish green letters, Spurb. You flip the box over, searching for features, but curiously, the glossy back has nothing, just a blank white expanse with a strange spirograph in the bottom right corner. Odd, yet intriguing. You open the box. Inside are two envelopes clearly containing a CD-ROM each. Each one has the same spirograph pattern on it with a different text in the center. On the first, client, and on the second, server. You peek inside the box to locate instructions or promotions, but all that falls out is a leaflet, which is similarly inscrutable. Instructions. Connect to clients via servers to complete a chain. The Betty Crocker Company assumes no responsibility for any consequences of playing Spurb. Ominous. You figure that's some kind of generic legalese that they have to include, but still, it's a creepy warning. Still, you feel fired up. This game is mysterious and new, and you've got to play it with your friends on your birthday. You might not like game bro, but you do like video games. Who doesn't? You decide to hop into the group chat that you and your three friends frequent to plan. After all, it's 2009. What possible reason would there be to talk exclusively one-on-one -on -one with your friends? Back. Sup, Rolal? Hello, David. Hey, Dave. I got the game you sent. There's two discs in here, though. Did you send me, like, a, a two-pack? Nah, nah, see, it's this two-disc thing. Leave it to a fledgling dev to make a confusing-ass game installation. There are two discs, server and client. Basically, you have to install one, then connect to someone with the other copy. Here, I'll connect to you as a server, Johnny Boy. You install the client disc, and I'll take you through it. Don't forget about me. Oh, shit. You bothered to get the game? And you want to play with the boys? Yes, Dave. I'm something of a gamester myself. I'll have you know. A gamesman, if you will. I will not. I simply wanted to get in on this fad and have some fun with you all before we at last converged at university. Fucking you two with college talk now, huh? Whatever, just hold on. Bro's on my ass again, I'll be right back. Okay, Dave, I installed the client like you said, but you bought the game too, Rose? As I said, a last hurrah with you all. Or, since we're all about to head to university, perhaps a first hurrah? I didn't even know you liked games. I thought you went in for, like, books. I'm known to game. Mostly I watch Sims. You watch Sims? You make it sound creepy. Like you're one of those weirdos who deletes the ladder and watches them drown. I've been known to curtail Sims' lives, yes. There's no harm in social experimentation with the artificially intelligent. Just because they are in the guise of humans doesn't mean they are. I'm just happy I knew of a video game before the illustrious game bro himself, John Egbert. Or should I say, game person? And goodbye again. I'm going to bone up on Spurb Online so I can kick both your asses. Very well, bone it will. I will install the game whilst we await Dave and his fickle brother. You navigate to you and your cohort's preferred message board, VG Fax. Looks like there are some familiar faces posting about Spurb already. Does anyone know how to install? Confused. Can I play offline? Sorry, big man. Right now it's online only. And since it just came out today, there are probably tons of people trying to connect. Fuck. It's not like Crocker Corp doesn't have the scroll to make some beefy servers. I connected just fine. Make sure to daisy, taint, uh, daisy chain your server client connections. I'm sure the kinks will be ironed out soon. Also, how are we all pronouncing spurb? Is it suburb or spurb? I say spurb to make it as fucked up as possible to speak. I'm pretty sure anything is fine, though. Are there any guides? Guides? The game shipped today, brain genius. I'm penning an FAQ as we speak, but it's slow going. Aren't you the person who made a guide for the best way to kill Sims characters, TT? Perhaps. Holy shit, this thing is immersive. Some serious tech in this game. Are you in game? Yeah, I'm in with Wash and Bucky. I can't explain it, just... You guys have to try this. This is frankly cringe-inducing to read. The game sucks ass. I've played it already, and it's worthless and boring. It's for adolescent losers who shit their pants. Any semblance of challenge is lost due to numerous exploits. Didn't you get banned, CG? How's that going for you? What kind of game even is this? RPG? Action-adventure? 
I didn't even know. It's hard to describe, like, a VR thing, like enhanced reality. Whoa. I just hope it's not a cheap gimmick. It better not be. I spent 50 bucks on this stupid thing. No questions were answered, only more raised. Your excitement to get playing is mounting, and you're starting to not want to wait for your errant friend. Impatiently, you message the group. Any news from Dave? Negative. I have to say, the anticipation is rather mounting. No one even knows what this game is. Yeah, they're talking about it like it's going to end world hunger or something. Indeed. I'd like to pioneer this sooner rather than later. We're already lacking behind those who obtained a midnight release. Hmm. Should we wait for Dave? No need. As the forum said, we can daisy-chain connections and bring him in later. Hmm. Perhaps it's time we begin ourselves, eh, Egbert? Looks like Dave is taking his sweet time. His brother sure eats a lot of Dave's aforementioned sweet time, it seems, a fact which normally would worry you. No matter, though. Rose offered to play the game with you, so why the heck not? What harm could playing some video game inexplicably released by an international baking conglomerate possibly do? You take a deep breath, and with an eager, steady hand, you slide the client disk from its envelope, placing it on the disk tray of your computer. Without hesitation, your computer begins setup. As your PC whirs to life, you lean back in your chair, watching the loading bar scroll lazily up, taking a brief moment to ruminate before you embark. Your dad is wrong. Internet friends are as real as they come. The fact that he can't accept that makes something resentful fester in your stomach. How could your friends, Dave and Rose, not be real if they make you feel so excited to finally meet them? You've been friends with them all for a long time. You all met in the VG Facts forums when you were 13, and over those five years since, you forged a deep bond. You, Rose, Dave, and another of your friends all secured a place at Northern Illinois University, and in a few short months, you'll all be going there together for college, an event that feels both like the culmination of your young adult lives and the beginning of a journey into the unknown with them. This game, then, is both the beginning and the end of an era. The turning point. You take a slow, deep breath as the loading bar approaches its end. You don't know why, but watching the game boot up feels momentous to you. It's an odd feeling, but it's not hard to understand why. It feels as though this game is you bidding goodbye to the space between you and your friends, bidding goodbye to the impossible space between you all. You exhale your held breath to feel the breeze roll in your open window, like your breath guides it, pushing you forward. The loading bar completes, and your screen goes black before flashing a plain UI message. Spurb client installed. You wait. Nothing happens. The loading light on your PC tower fades. Wait, what? All that trepidation for nothing? What a ripoff! You wait another moment, frown furrowing your brow before irritably turning to the chat once more. Ah, nothing happened. On the contrary. I believe it worked. Can you see me? See you? Like, in the game? I think so. I can see you. It's difficult to explain. Let me try something. Ah, my screen just went blank. And there are no specs in the stupid little manual. Do you think my computer is good enough? I can run Oblivion. I believe if you installed the client copy, nothing happens on your computer. Should I install the server one, then? Yes. Then we can be mutual client servers. Uh, wait. No. Maybe you ought to hold off. I think this works by chaining together servers and clients. I'm your server, you are Dave's server, then he'll be my server, thereby closing the server-client loop. At least, I think? I'm gonna install the server copy. This is boring. Don't do that yet, John, and hold still. What do you mean, hold still? I'm not in the game. You're not? No. Odd. I can see you. You said that already. How do you see me? I just see you. Inside your bedroom. What? Okay, hardy har. I'm serious, John. Hold still. This is totally lousy. This game sucks, Rose. Maybe GameBro was right. 1.5 hats. John, I know you're famously impatient, but I must insist that you just hold on. I'm going to try something. All right, all right. Could you move from your chair, John? What? John, please, I don't know how long I can hold it. Hold what? You're not making any sense, dingus. What's going on, chuds? I'm back. Aw, oh, fuck. Did you start without me? Yeah, but don't worry, we can get you in now. Tight. Rose is blathering on about me not moving, but I'm gonna install the server, okay? 
Sick nasty, Brahanus Brahms. John, look out! Relax, for the last time, Rose, I'm not in the game yet. Yeah, John, look out. A lesbian is gonna psychoanalyze you. John, please, for the love of God, duck! You're not sure what prank Rose is pulling, but it looks like you installed the wrong version of this stupid game. The server copy sounds way more interesting. You reach for the other disc that came in Dave's gift, before you hear something thud. Feel a great throbbing pain in the back of your skull, and black out completely. Your name is Rose Lalonde. As you recline on your bed, hands behind your ghostly white hair, your lavender eyes scan the ceiling. Even though you've just awoken, a fresh coat of matte black lipstick festoons your lips, which are presently pursed into a thin, severe line, as always. You might be slight, a mere five foot two without so much as a single rope of muscle, but you have a distinct feminine severity that makes even the most grizzled of old men hesitate before telling you to smile more often. Whenever someone tells you you look like a librarian, you smile. The rain outdoors falls in gray sheets. Lightning cracking across the New England sky as a branch wraps your cozy bedroom window. It's the atmosphere you most enjoy, holding a book in one hand and a knitting needle in the other, or perhaps enjoying a conversation with one of your many friends. Presently, however, you have bigger fish to fry than the rain outside in its lovely atmosphere, namely, corresponding with a certain friend of yours who's having a birthday. Sadly, as you are several hours ahead of him on the East Coast, he's probably still asleep. No matter. This gives you much-needed reading time. You crack open one of your trusty tomes, a black-bound book with a sinister title, your favorite kind. The grimoire for summoning the zoologically dubious, the stock title reads, with creepy drawings of weird tentacle monsters underneath it. This book was a gift from the same friend who is celebrating a birthday. So you find it thematically appropriate to explore on this, a gray and momentous occasion. You flip open the page to the bookmarked entry. The Grimoire for Summoning the Zoologically Dubious. Glib Glib, Preserver of Life, Speaker of the Vast Glub, Emissary to the Dark Gods. Let not the name of this dread beast fool you. Floating in the pools of an alien planet, the Preserver of Life's epithet serves not to describe some benevolent conservation of life, no, the emissary is a dark beast, with lungs and vocal flaps lining its innards. It preserves life, only in that it allows her charges to continue living, having the power to wipe them out with ease. Should it ever deign to open its beak for any purpose outside of feasting, it will emit its undersea caterwaul, erupting on the surface in what scholars know as the Vast Glove. Once the speaker of the Vast Glove howls, all life in the galaxy will come to an abrupt end. Fear not, though, readers, as its speech is kept to a whisper through the efforts of her keeper, the Witch of Life, who keeps the speaker sated by feeding her the creatures of the sea. Should the witch ever fail, the vast club will reverberate around Paradox Space. Ah, yes, you do so love to read about the Lovecraftian monstrosities. Sadly, you no sooner crack the page than you hear something that makes your blood boil. Something far, far worse than any of the heinous monsters housed within this arcane tome. A sound far more horrid than the vast glove itself. Honey, come down for Breck! Breck? Oh, your mother means breakfast. She tries to stay hip with the lingo by shortening words, but it just makes her already slurred speech even more incomprehensible. Honey! The voice demands, gaining a grating tone. You pinch the bridge of your nose and descend the staircase of your home towards the kitchen to avoid any more motherly screeching. Your home is of modern design, your mother being a very wealthy scientist working at the nearby Skynet Labs. She works in renewable energy, and the sound of your home's hydroelectric generator hums gently along with a river that runs directly underneath your floor. Your mother is in the kitchen awaiting your arrival with a grim smile on her face, hands clasped. Ah, uh, I see you've opted for the Bloody Mary breakfast. You dryly state, noting the glass on the counter next to her own meal, a rye bagel with cream cheese, untoasted. It says a lot that she doesn't eat what she cooks for you. It's always five o'clock somewhere, Rosie, your mother says, winking. 
You don't react. It's 7 a.m. here, though. You say without pause, letting the quip fall flat. Your mother just looks away and laughs emptily. A beat of silence as she seems to force herself to perk up. I made Breck. She repeats that irritating word again. You look down at the dining room table, upon which is the classic breakfast. Two eggs and three bacon strips, lined up in a smiling face. The only issue is the eggs are runny enough to be raw, and the bacon has been seared to inedible pieces of what might as well be tree bark. Goodness, Mother. You say, more sarcastic than you intended. I simply couldn't deign to eat such a culinary delight you've so earnestly poured your effort into. You withdraw your phone, snapping a photo, wiping a false tear from your eye. This is worthy of a museum, Mother. Not my stomach. Come on. Don't you want some of Mama's home cooked? Your mother begins, her voice cracking a little. No. You cut her off. I do believe I shall have to, once again, retire to my room with no breakfast. When will you stop making such prodigal dishes, Mother? Truly, a chef was your true calling. She falls silent, lips pursed, and you can tell she knows she's made a mistake. You used to feel bad when she balked like this, but now you simply don't care. For eighteen years you've suffered good-natured mothering that has failed in every regard except intentions. Your mother is single, of course. A chronic bachelorette who has had more suitors than you can count with an alcohol habit so bad you've had to hold her hair once a week for the past near decade. You always wonder why she chose to keep you. She is a scientist at the top of her field, and you are so clearly a nuisance on her life that it hurts for her to so much as smile at you. You feel like a burden, and you feel burdened in the same I, house. I'm sorry. I never really learned to cook or anything. She nearly whispers. Again, she sounds heartbroken, but neglect has left your heart cold. When you don't respond, she slides the mess into the garbage. I guess I just... Before you have to hear another deluge of excuses from your alcoholic mother, you interrupt. I'm going to be in my room, you say, turning your back on Roxanne Lalonde. As you walk away, you hear her yet again force enthusiasm, slurping down her Bloody Mary, already opening the fridge for more OJ. All right, sweetie. I love you. You don't reply. In your room, you flip open your laptop and check your correspondences. Dave and John are both fast asleep, but one name is still illuminated as online. Hello, Jade. Another late night? <laughs> Hi, Rose. <laughs> More like early morning. You keep odder hours than I do. Well, I'm in a way different time zone. How is life on a deserted island, anyway? Or was it a gleaming golden city in which you lived, where the clouds give you a view of the future? Rose! Did you have another argument with your mom? You're so cranky today. Apologies. You hit the nail on the head, as a matter of fact. I'm sorry, being sarcastic is a habit by now. It's okay. And for the record, I'm not making that stuff up. I do live on an island, with my grandpa. And what of the gold cities? Those are just dreams, dummy. Important dreams. But I don't live there. Curiouser and curiouser, Miss Jade. You're one to talk. So... Did you get the game? I did. I apologize. If you truly do live on some remote island, you'll probably have to wait to play with us until someone can ship you a copy. Nope. I have one. Oh. A pre-order or some such? <laughs> Something like that. So cryptic. And your internet is good enough to play with us, then? Well, maybe. I don't know. It all depends on how things shake out. It's a big day over here. Well, however this game situation ends up, I'm excited to see you at college this fall. Rose, I already told you. I'm not going to college. Wait, what? But you got into Northern Illinois just like Dave, John, and I, didn't you? Of course I was accepted. It's the issue then. Money? No, no, it's just not in the cards. I don't think... Jade... Is this about one of your dreams? Yeah, exactly. Jade, you cannot seriously be thinking of skipping college because it came to you in a dream. Dreams can be symbolic, but they aren't prophetic, no matter how many of yours have allegedly come true. 
Allegedly, she says. It's not that I don't want to go, Rose. I just have a feeling I'll be somewhere else soon. That's all I can explain, okay? Very well. Just promise you'll at least try if you're able. Fair. I'll make sure the boys save you a spot in the game, just in case. Thanks, Rose. I've gotta go. Beck is bugging me. After this sidebar with your strangest compatriot, you notice your aforementioned birthday friend is now available. Predictably, this friend is John, and you proceed to have a series of conversations with him, which culminates in installing the game. However, things go differently for you, the server player. For starters, unlike your friend John, your own copy opens up a game interface, overlaid on what you assume is a view of John's webcam. Ah, nothing happened! On the contrary. I believe it worked. Can you see me? See you? Like, in the game? I think so. I can see you. It's difficult to explain. Let me try something. Ah, my screen just went How blank. curious, this there game. Upon more inspection, the view opens up, showing John in his bedroom in its entirety. View unbounded by his webcam. You have no clue what kind of technology might lie within this game, but it seems advanced. Above the view of John's room, on your screen, are a variety of icons, all seeming to be some different function of cursor. You click the one labeled Grab. It reminds you of The Sims. You are able to mouse around and get different view of his rooms and his truly unfortunate movie posters on the walls. Behind John, you mouse over something with this new Grab cursor in his room, a large teal blue book on the bookshelf, clicking to see what happens. To your astonishment, the book begins to hover, dragged by your mouse. John, sadly, remains petulantly glued to his computer screen, blind to the floating book behind him. Or perhaps it's just an overlay and there really is no book. You have no idea, nor enough experience with video games to extrapolate how weird this is. Hold still! What do you mean, hold still? I'm not in the game. You're not? No. Odd. I can see you. You said that already. How do you see me? I just... See you. Inside your bedroom. What? Okay, hardy har. To your adaptation, the book isn't leaving your mouse even as you let go. You don't want to throw it, so you check the instruction manual, finding there is none. I'm going to try something. All right, all right. Could you move from your chair, John? What? John, please, I don't know how long I can hold it. Hold what? You're not making- You take a breath and click. Fortunately, this does successfully let go of the book. Unfortunately, you witness the book bonk against John's head, then your friend crumple to the floor, motionless. John, look out! Relax, for the last time, Rose, I'm not in the game yet. Yeah, John, look out. A lesbian is gonna psychoanalyze you. John, please, for the love of God, duck! It's too late. Fuck. Fuck, did you just kill your friend? No, that can't be right. This is a, this is a video game. When you die in the game, do you die for real? John? Lamau, did something actually bean you, dude? John, please respond. My mental health hinges on it. Uh, Johnny boy. TT, what the fuck did you do? Did you quantum murder my friend? If I say I don't know, will you be more angry or confused? The fuck do you mean you don't know? You either did or you didn't. You watch the screen, mousing back and forth. Oof, he looks down for the count. Maybe if you, like, grab a bucket of water and splash it on him? You scroll over to his bathroom, finding the sink. Good. This will be awkward, but it just might work. Hesitantly, you click on the sink. Fuck. You hiss. You'd only click the tap to turn it on, but the entire blooming fixture tore itself out of the wall. You let go, but it's too late, the porcelain sink clattering to the ground, causing a spray of water from the pipes to erupt. Dave, answers, now. Okay. John still isn't back. What did you do? Tell me what you know about this game. I think I've just knocked our friend John unconscious. How in tarnation did you do that? You are literally across a United States. Evidently, with this video game you can control other spaces. And using that power, I've... Fuck. I don't know, I'm just worried. Wow. I don't think I've ever seen you freak out like this. It's kinda wild. The unflappable becomes the flapped. Sadly, before you can load a witty retort into the chamber and press enter, your screen goes black. As does your room. Your heart thuds. No. No, 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 no. 
Your friend is unconscious, possibly in real life, possibly in a game. This is no time for a power surge. You uselessly click the power key, but it's no use. This hunk of junk is so old that its battery is worthless without being plugged in. You run your hands through your blonde hair, growling in frustration. Mother! You call out, gathering your laptop and power cable, depositing them in a small laptop cozy you knitted yourself. The power's out! You're stating the obvious in their mother's snorts. You're telling me. I only half shaved my gams with the old electric razor. Your mother, already tipsy, emerges from the bathroom, one leg slathered in lotion, the other dusted with blonde leg hairs. We have a generator underneath this confounded abode, mother. How did this happen? Your voice is more demanding than you intended it to be. Your mom shrugs. The generator's for mama's lab. The rest of the house runs on plain old city electricity. You look out the window. The rain is pounding even harder now, so hard it almost looks like nighttime. The woods surrounding your home is thick, giving you a potent feeling of claustrophobia. I'm going to the observatory. You had solar panels installed there, right? You point your thumb upstairs. Rosie, just relax. You can talk to your little friends later. Don't go up there. The rain's gonna make the stairs slick, and there's no guardrail leading up there anymore. The observatory is a tower that is attached to your house by an outdoor staircase. You have fond memories of sleeping there as a child in a sleeping bag, while your mother explained the planets and stars to you, while shining lights on the domed ceiling. It was a simpler time, and the memory keeps you from snapping angrily at your mother. Fine. You lie. Once your mom wobbles back into the bedroom, you're going to make a break for the observatory, hell, or high water. The door leading to the observatory stairs exits the flat roof of your home. The moment you open it, you're blasted in the face with pelting rain. Even though you've sealed your laptop cozy inside an oversized Ziploc bag, you feared it getting waterlogged before long, so you make haste. Not only is your house tall, the staircase sits over top of the river that flows under your house, meaning one false move, and you're toast. The water is particularly high today, meaning that the current must be fierce to match. Your jaw sets. Now, not only is John in danger, but your mom has told you not to do something. And as all children know, mom's telling you not to do something is the best way to make that thing seem cool and great to do. You realize this, and how foolish it is, but in spite of this, you take the first step onto the slippery stairs. Your mother was correct. The guardrail, being ancient, had fallen off the stairs a while back, meaning neither you nor your mom has been out here in a while. You hope that means that the solar array has collected a lot of power. One step, then two, clapping against the wet stone. Your teeth chatter and you're already soaked, praying your poor laptop is safe, writing off your shirt and lavender skirt is doomed to the rain. You make the mistake of looking down and gasp loudly. It's only a twenty-foot drop. One that you could survive with maybe a broken bone, but it's a drop with water at the bottom. Still, your hand closes around the doorknob of the observatory, and before you know it, you're slumped against the door. You stand after catching your breath, hand hesitating before flicking the light switch. Yes! You breathe as the lights pop on. Power! You hasten to dash over to an outlet on the wall near the defunct telescope that once peeked out into the stars and listen to the rain batter the metal dome as you watch your computer boot up. To your relief, the game opens right where you left it. A view of John's now ruined bathroom, now featuring a middle-aged man in a trilby shouting inside of it. Sorry, John's dad, but you can't worry about the consequences of those actions yet. You zoom out trying to find John's room again with the Sims-like view of your sperb controls. John, have you recovered? Please respond, or I fear I may lose my remaining sanity points. Hello? Dave? John? Fucking bullshit. Stupid John and stupider Dave. You at last find John's room again, but to your frustration, John is not inside. Raking your nails down your face, you grit your teeth. Your heart skips, however, when you see a message from your bonked friend. Hey, Rose. Sorry, my dad's freaking out. My bathroom got fucked up somehow, and he thinks I did it. You've got to see this. This place is fucked. My goodness, your bathroom? How odd. I'm sure this has no relation to the oddities currently unfolding, and the specifics have likely evaporated into the ether. Let's discuss something else. Are you okay? Oh, right. 
Yeah, I think a book fell off the shelf and beamed me. Dave told me you did it somehow. Are you a ghost, Rose? For now, I'm safely encased in my meat suit, as it were. However, I am ready and able to turn you into a ghost if you don't listen to me carefully. I can't listen, Rose. We're in a web chat. Please uninstall the game. I do believe it's trying to murder us. You see John return to his room and sit at his computer instead of having to text you on his stupid little PDA thing. Honestly, iPhones exist, John. Wait, are you saying you really can see me? That's so creepy, Rose. How many fingers am I holding up? One. Your middle finger. What the fuck? Can you see me jerking it, Rose? What? No, I can't see you jerking it, you imbecile. Nor would I want to. This ability is new to me. Well, okay. If I jerk it, I'll let you know. Please don't watch me jerking it, Rose. I didn't think it needed stating, John, but I won't watch you jerk it. In return, please do not make me the witness to such an act. I guess you're like a lesbian anyway, so it doesn't matter. Hey, how did you find out you were a lesbian anyways, Rose? John, I'm going to bonk you with your stupid book again if you don't use your last remaining brain cells to focus. We don't have time to discuss my lesbianics. Hey, this book isn't stupid, it was my Nana's. Colonel Sassaker's daunting text of practical japery. I'm going to type in caps now, to indicate my stern irritation. John! Whoops, right. Focus. There's no quit game button, so I'm afraid I'm stuck watching you. I'll just leave the game alone and it will be fine. Probably. I don't know. It kind of seems fun to me. I did get beamed and you did apparently ruin my bathroom, but if we're careful, maybe it'll be worth playing. Are you sure? You're the one with the broken bathroom. Not that I had anything to do with that that could be proven in a court of law. Yeah, let's see it through. Well, okay. I found a set of instructions, though it's not evident for what purpose. It's more like a checklist. Okay, let's start there. I'll be like your sim. Okay, no, you kill your sims. Relax, John, please, before I remove all the ladders to your pools. In the corner of the screen, there's a three-step checklist written in a friendly, legible aerial font, provided by the game as a tutorial. 1. Deploy Cruxtruder. 2. Extrude Totem. 3. Prototype Sprites. 4. Alchemize Totem. 5. Enter. Well? I have no idea what the fuck any of this is. It says to deploy a Cruxtruder. What a Cruxtruder is, or how to deploy it, remains to be seen, but I will do it aggressively at the first chance. Whoa, Rose. Buy a girl dinner first. Oh, wait. Here, there's a catalog of machines I can... Oh, God. You find a drop-down menu of items, much like the purchase catalog for The Sims, but there aren't any items you recognize. One of them, however, does say Cruxtruder, which you click. What you didn't expect, however, is for the item to materialize in John's room, right in front of the bedroom door. Holy shit! Rose, you made a thing! Did you make that thing? The thing in question is odd. It looks like a tube attached to a large computer screen, which displays only a countdown clock. Ooh, that's ominous. There are only five minutes or so left on this thing. Perhaps that is when the top opens? Opens? Yes. See on the top? The tube has a cap on it. Heh. I'm gonna pop this bad boy open early. You said the step two was to extrude the totem, right? Well, I bet the totem is in there. Hang on! And to our abject shock, John leaps out his window, landing in the shrubs below, dashing back <laughs> indoors like a madman. John, what the fuck? Sadly, John is away from his computer for now. You decide to look through the rest of the catalog of items. Every one of these things has a little number next to it, and a lowercase g. Maybe this means gold. You don't have any gold, and neither does John, but luckily for you, there is one more free item. Something called an alchemeter. Seeing as there's no room to place it in John's bedroom, you place the odd contraption on the balcony. This one looks like a platform with a smaller tube next to it. I think I'm getting this. You get the tube from the Cruxtruder, then you put it in this alchemeter device. Head to your balcony after you get the tube. Your instructions are put on hold, however, as John reappears, scrambling back up to his room, pushing on the door. You see him check his dumb PDA again. Whoops, I can't get back into my room. You blocked my door, dingus. Move it out of the way. I can't. Moving larger objects costs some resource I don't have. Just squeeze inside. Wait, John, what are you holding? A sledgehammer!
You watch helplessly as the dumbest boy on the planet Earth rears back and swings the heavy mallet into his jaw like Jack Nicholson in The Shining, an equal amount of glee on his face. Here's Johnny! You face Palm. Once his door is open, he scrambles into it, seemingly unbothered by the idea of splinters. At the risk of a warning coming too late, John, please do not use the hammer on an alien item put inside your bedroom via video game wizardry. There are only two and a half minutes left, Rose. I gotta. John, think about this. I didn't smack all the sense out of you. John! Oh god, perhaps I did. Before you complete with him to stop, the lights suddenly go off, your computer following suit in five more seconds, just in time to see John gleefully bash the crux truder open, a neon glue sphere leaping out. Fuck. You hiss for the second time that day. That was less than an hour of juice. You shouldn't have left the lights on. You'll have to go back inside and see if you can sneak into your mother's lab. You grit your teeth. This lab isn't somewhere you should go. Mom forbade that when you were young, after you wandered down there as a child. It's the only stern order your mother has ever issued, but you can't just sit by while John faces danger. Or at least poses danger to himself. The entrance to your mother's lab is a locked door leading to the basement, the inside of which you've never seen. That entrance is bound to be sealed and monitored, so that's out. There is another entrance, though, on the lawn, an entrance that your mother believes you don't know about. You look out the window towards the front lawn in the direction of said secret entrance, above which sits a grim-looking stone mausoleum. You decide to head there post-haste. But before you can do that, a meteor strikes the observatory. Your name is Dave Strider. It's hot as balls here in Texas, but you stay cool as fuck. Not just because your fan is pumping full blast, but because you're cool yourself. So cool you even wear shades indoors. Okay, full disclosure. You might be cool in demeanor, but you're not cool in temperature. The fan might be blowing your straw gold hair around, but it's just moving around the heat. Behind your bangs, your forehead dots with sweat. You're a skinny fucker too. Six foot one, built like someone stapled several wooden boards together and animated it like a golem. You might be big and awkward, but a sufficiently strong person could probably pick you up by the ankle and toss you across the football stadium. Not that you'd ever let that shit happen in a million years. It's a big day for you, not in small part because it's your pal John's birthday, but also because you've decided to tell your friends your horrible secret that you've been keeping for ages. You and three friends decided to go to the same university after high school, a place near Chicago called Northern Illinois. Selected due to being roughly equidistant from all of you. To begin with, you went along with the plans, but the truth is, you were never going to college. It just wasn't in the cards. Still, lying to your friends feels shitty, so you've decided to come clean today. Play one last video game with them as friends, and then tell them your hard secret. Or at least that was the plan. Right now, your friends are being grade A dunces and farting around instead of playing games. Some bullshit about bonking each other on the head with books and ruining sinks. You're glad you're above all that petty shenanigan You decide to let your two pals sort out their shit and chat with your least insane friend and confidant. Yo, Chad, you up? Up and at him. Chad Buskin, at your humble service. I assume you obtained the sweet discs, my man? Sure did. But to play with TT and EB. A badass troop of motherfuckers if ever there was. I wish you could play with us, big guy, but... I understand those cats are important to you. Yeah. It's not like you and me can't play together sometime either. Something just feels so fucked up about this. You've been sitting on a shitty secret for all hells of time, dog. Take your mind off it. Just be careful. I hear the game is pretty intense. The message boards are lighting up about this shit. No shit. I saw yesterday the pre-release thread was full of troll weirdos. God, none of them can spell. They're all stuck in the leet speak days. Even so, they might not be talking total shit. How so? They knew stuff about the game that they shouldn't have, for starters. I'm not saying to talk to them, but they might have some tips. LMAO. That's just bad luck. Some group of chuds who all type like jackasses get early access to the most anticipated game of the year. Ain't that just how it is? Game Facts, your haunt of choice for online video game discussion.
As usual, the threads are all noobs trying to figure out how to play the game. You decide to avoid these to evade potential spoilers and instead log back into the pre-release thread, rereading old messages from last night. I for one can't wait, my dudes. I'm picking up mine from the post office first thing. You imbeciles don't stand a chance. What kind of name is Buskin, anyway? The kind that fucks your mom. <laughs> hey! What the fuck is a mom? God damn, if that isn't the saddest shit I've ever heard. How would someone's name even fuck anybody? Yo, GC, why do you type like that? Leetspeak is so old hat, I can barely understand you. How old are you, anyway? Nine? <laughs> Someone get this child out of here. This is pointless. These clowns don't even have any game knowledge. You keep strolling past where you checked out the night before. I'm telling you, fools, don't bother playing. I'm serious. If I find out that any of you started the game, I'll personally see to it that you're flayed alive. Let's chill with the threats, dude. This is for on-topic game shit. Shut the fuck up! If you play this game, you will die! Do you not understand that? You keep saying that, but you've played it, and you seem to be alive, CG. Correct, because I'm a superior specimen to you, sad cretins. The troll race in general, of which I am an exemplar, are your gods. Bow down or I'll lay down the hurt. User was banned for this post. <laughs> Trolls race. Oh my god. Get banhammered. Thanks, Mod. Sorry about my horrible friend, everyone. But he's not lying. The game is dangerous. First you're just building alchemizers and messing around, and the next second you're fighting for your lives. What's an alchemeter? This seems boring. People all over the world are excited to play this game. It's not hard to imagine some pack of trolls got a hold of the game early and decided to fearmonger about it. You peer out the window of your apartment building. You're on the highest floor beneath the roof, floor 9, meaning it's hot as can be, no matter how hard the fan chugs along. It's oddly bright out today, too, the sun boring down on you. In the sky near the sun, you see a strange black speck. Huh? That's odd. You squint at it. It's too far away to be an aircraft, but the sunlight is making it fuzzy. Dave! You hear from behind you and nearly leap out of your skin. You blink, eyes adjusting to the dimmer light of your room. Two for flinching, you hear, and your big bro socks you twice on the arm, smirking. Much like yourself, your bro wears shades indoors, but he prefers the sharp anime shades to your rounded aviators. He also wears a ball cap inside, even though he's never so much as thrown a baseball. In the presence of your bro, your demeanor changes, and you stand up straighter. N need something? You ask, trying to sound as mild as possible. You hate when bro silently barges into your room, but it's not like you can tell him off. Roof in ten, he says in his usual clip tone, a casual reminder. Over his shoulder is slung his favorite prop, a puppet of his own design with a creepy cherubic face known as Lil' Cal. You fucking hate that puppet. R Roof, right. Uh, I'll be up, you promise. As he walks away out into the hall, you wince. Over his shoulder, little Cal stares at you, his eerily blue eyes boring into your own. You hear the sound of water rushing not long after. Looks like it's shower time for him. That means you'll have some privacy at least. Your brother is a puppet maker. It's a profession you've not gotten used to in all your 18 years of life. Puppets leer from every shelf. Half-completed bodies lie about in every living space except your room like tiny, pristine corpses. He makes most of his money repairing and restoring them for rich patrons, but his true passion is making them. The issue being, of course, how fucking insanely scary they all look. You shudder as a toy plush of Jigsaw from the Saw movies watches you from atop the microwave. Might as well stock up on grub now before a roof time. You head to your room to check up on your pals. Rose? John? Anyone? Hi, Dave! Yo, it's Jade. Glad you're in on the spurb action. Hopefully. I've been taking care of stuff, so he won't be available for a while. Rose! Johnny boy. Uh, Rose isn't online. Fuck! 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 Oh! Uh... Are they already playing? Yep. Oh, jeez. Things are going faster than I thought. Jade, you always say the most cryptic, insane shits. Never change. <laughs> I think we have time to make, like, some kind of loop to get in. Yes, 
a server client loop. I believe you're going to be Rose's server once she installs the client disk, which she will soon once her power comes back on. Tight. I guess that's why she's so spotty. Rose! Rose, do you see the clown? Uh. Ooh, does this game have clowns? I didn't know that. Fuck, no, I hope not. Clowns are creepy. Dave, clowns are your friends. Honk. <laughs> Stop. Fuck! Looks like uh, the game is pretty stressful. Anyways, I got a blast. Bro's waiting for me. Oh, Dave, before you go hang out with your brother, install the server program so you can be ready for Rose. Oh, good thinking. You turn in your seat after setting the installation to start and nearly leap out of your skin. Without noticing, bro placed little Cal on the table behind you with a little note. Roof, now bring Cal. The message sends a shudder down your spine, but you know you have to. You walk up the stairs, little Cal in hand, opening the heavy metal door to the blazing hot blacktop of the roof. You squint in the sun behind your shades, glancing up. The speck is still there. For some reason, it's making you feel foreboding. You're late, says bro. You don't know if that's true or not, because he always says that no matter what time you arrive. Sorry, you say automatically, tossing little Cal towards him. Go easy on Cal, dog. He's a pristine piece. Bro catches the puppet, gingerly setting him in a seated position on top of the AC, fan humming away nearby. Bro cracks his knuckles with the leather of his fingerless gloves, squeaking. Ready, little man? You and your brother have been having rooftop duels since before you can remember. Until you were about 14, you assumed every parental figure sparred with their kids, but when you met John, he informed you that his dad never did anything of the sort. You guess you're just fucking special. It's not you don't like the idea of working out or getting strong, it's just that bro has never held back against you in his life. You've never even come close to beating him, and he always leaves you aching in a heap. You learn that this, too, is not normal. Bro, you say, voice cracking. Your brother stops you. I know you don't want to fight, little man, he says, already anticipating this. But sometimes you have to fight, even when you don't want to. Especially those times. Got it? You lower into a fighting stance half-heartedly, fists clenched. You're not bad at fighting, per se. MMA was a great love of yours once upon a time, and... Against your peers, you're pretty competent. Hell, you even enjoyed wrestling in school, even though you were the scrawniest featherweight anyone had ever seen. But bro isn't a peer. Weak, he proclaims, clipping the side of your head with a swipe, using the distraction to kick your legs from under you. Clatter onto the hard asphalt. Try again, bro says. As usual, he sounds like he's not just disappointed, but annoyed. You pant, and like always, you fall for it. You swing, growling, and he dodges with ease, kicking you in the stomach. Try again. Those two words are like poison to your brain. Try again is his constant refrain, his demand, his mantra. He repeats them every time you fail, and the way he spits them at you makes you feel like you're a failure. You grit your teeth and your heart pounds fiercely. You look him up and down for some opening, just one good punch, one decent kick, but it's just not there. So for the first time in your life, you close your eyes. Come on, bro, you offer. Just, can we not? What? Bro sounds taken aback. If you don't defend yourself, I'm going to kick the shit out of you, little man. Is that what you want? Kind of, you hear yourself say. You can't even bring yourself to care. You don't care if he does. You just want to slink back to your room. Bro grabs you by the collar, lifting you to your toes. You need to get it through your head, little man. He hisses, breath hot on your face. You flinch, and he shakes you for it. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, Dave. I've tried to show you that, but it looks like you still want to live in fantasy land. You don't speak, shaking like a leaf. Is he really going to hit you? He's never fought you while you were defenseless before. You just close your eyes, waiting 
and tensing for the punch. Instead, Bro drops you like a sack of apples heading indoors. You lay on the blacktop for the next few minutes, dead to the world. When you're back inside, the server application finished loading, but that small victory is lost on you. Instead, you open up the chat client. Bro didn't beat the shit out of me. I guess that's all there is to say on the matter. Damn! So you stood up to him? I guess. Didn't feel like standing up, it felt more like getting yelled at for saying no. Well, you laid off. Uh, fuck, dude. Do you need to jam about it? No, oh, man, I'm okay. Or I will be, or whatever. I just need to get the hell out of here. He's right, though. He says it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and I'm gonna be a dog who gets the shit eaten out of him. I don't think that at all, Dave. Sorry, Chad. <laughs> I talk too fucking much, huh? Shut up, man. You know I don't care. You need to abscond that shit house and obtain some bitches. Nothing some hot sluts can't amend. Well, I guess in your case, like, hot studs? <laughs> Shut the fuck up, dude. I like bitches as much as the next guy. Alright, man. You just enjoy being in that closet for now. I've got a dip. It's time for me and the guys to start the game. You lean back. At least Chad has your back. You've known him for longer than even Rose and John. He used to go to your elementary school before moving away. There's something so comforting about the nostalgia of old friends. Part of you wishes that you could be part of his suburb sesh, but as you peer at the screen, you know it's okay. Yo. Dave, Jade said you installed the server copy? I'm gonna connect to you presently. Whoa, buy me dinner first, Lalonde. Shut up, weirdo. Sorry. It was just a joke. I know you're a big lesbo. It's not because I'm a lesbian, shit brain. John fake flirts with me, and I couldn't give two shits. Well, we both know John is... you, you know... Indeed. But it's just... weird when you do it. Oh, well, I'm not gonna lie. I think you're right. I'll lay off. When I say that shit to you, it's like I'm saying it to my sister. Like some Luke Leia shit, you feel? Precisely. Now be quiet while I connect. You should be able to see me soon. Sure enough, your screen lights up with, uh, a house? I don't see shit but a dark house. Right. That's my house. You can look around with the scroll wheel. Okay, so like, what is this, a model? No, it's my real house. If you navigate to the kitchen, you'll see my mother. Jesus. I've seen pics, but she looks fucking rancid. In Rose's kitchen, you see a middle-aged yet elegant woman sobbing into a martini. You feel like you shouldn't be seeing this. What's she doing? Uh, sitting? Classic. Let me guess. It's about ten. She's drinking a martini. I guess? The lush. Uh, no comment. Good idea. Look, just deploy the alchemeter and Cruxtruder in my room. Where are you anyway? I don't see you. I'm elsewhere. Deploy those machines. Did you do it? No, I'm uh, looking around. Dave, don't fuck around. Deploy the machines. Please. Holy shit. Rose Lalonde said please. Stop the presses. Holy shit. Dave Strider wouldn't shut up. Don't stop the presses. This is completely normal. Ignore Rose for a moment, zooming out. Rose's house is pretty nice, and you feel a pang of jealousy. It's raining quite hard, but there's an odd glow around everything. Uh, Rose, listen, I don't want to freak you out, but, uh... The woods is on fire? Oh, yeah. Like, super on fire. Dave, did you deploy the machines? No. I'm going to kill you. Rose, no offense, but, uh, you need to leave. I I'm serious, it's like the whole woods. Shit. Shit, I'm calling 911. Can you do that for, like, other areas? Fuck. Dave, for the love of God! You feel panic growing, looking around the property at the burning, smoky trees. Rose, fuck. Okay, I'm calling 911. Dave, what is it with you people today? Rose, I'm freaking out here. I can tell. Please, stop doing that. Or wait until you've... And I can't emphasize this enough. Deployed the machines. Okay, okay, fuck, Jesus. In a panic, you locate the two machines in question and place them. You can't find Rose's room, and you don't want her mom to see, so you choose. Okay, done. That was like pulling teeth. They're both in my room. Uh. Just 
Tell me where they are. I'm about to be on the move. Well... You look at the screen. Once you've placed the machines, it seems you can't move them. The roof? You're dead to me. You wince. Today's been stressful. Have you talked to John yet? No. I know I need to, but I've been occupied. With what? I'll explain later. Does he need anything? He mentioned, uh, a, a clown? A clown. Oh, dear God. I hope he's not talking about his colonel. I'd make a dirty joke about colonels, but I'm seriously lost. Sorry, what? What possible dirty joke could be made with colonel? Uh, the prostate. Duh. Ah, uh, obviously. Look, just don't worry about it yet. Once he's back, he'll connect to you and we'll connect the loop. I don't know what that means, but I trust you, I guess. So this game, like, it is real. So it seems. Fuck. Fuck. If we die in the game, do we die for real? I would assume so. I'll talk to you soon, okay? Just be on standby. You run your hands through your hair. Shit. You realize something suddenly and switch chat tabs. Chad. Chad, dude. Hey, big guy. Can't talk for long. Listen, you can't play this game, dude. It's, like, actually dangerous. I think the trolls were right. Like, epilepsy trigger stuff or something? I've heard about that stuff happening. No, fuck. Okay, then. How's a computer game supposed to be dangerous? I can't explain. Just give me a sec. I'd love to, my dude, but I really have to go. I'll probably be off all day. Wait. Damn it. You need a breather. You take a long, deep breath, forcing your pulse to slow. Leaning on your windowsill, squinting up at the speck in the sky again. Did it get... bigger? Before you can take a better look, a crow flies into your open window. What the hell? God, what? No! Stop! Fuck! Get out of the house! Your name is John Egbert. Again. You just bashed in your own bedroom door with a sledgehammer and sledged open the cap on a magical device a magical game placed in your bedroom called a Cruxtruder. It's been an odd day so far, but sadly it doesn't stop from getting weirder. Your father, luckily for you, is in the garage, grabbing some tools and various things to fix the recently obliterated sink, so he's not there to hear you bash down your door. When he does see it, however, he's probably going to kill the shit out of you. As you give the Cruxtruder a mighty whack, the lid flies off, and from beneath, two things spring out. First, an odd-looking cylinder that looks to you like a vase, and second, a glowing circular... something. It's incredibly hard to describe what you're looking at, it appears to be a glowing disc or orb, floating and flashing in midair, floating on its own power, emitting a bell-like chime. What the fuck? You ask, as if it could possibly answer you. You look down at the vase thing, now in your hands. This must be... the totem? Rose mentioned this. To put it in the alchemeter? Come on, orb, you say, motioning for it to follow, which to your shock, it does. You walk onto your porch, sliding the totem into the cylinder on the alleged alchemeter. Nothing happens. Well, that sucks, you say, disappointed. Rose, this lame tube didn't do anything. Rose, I'm starting to think this game sucks. You put away your totally cool PDA, walking back downstairs. Your dad hasn't come back in yet. You wonder what the hell has taken him so long. Still, something strikes your fancy. In the living room is the massive gift your dad told you not to touch. With a twinkle of mischief in your eyes, you approach the forbidden box. After all, when a parent tells you not to do something, it's almost inevitable that it will happen. You tear off the packaging, the orb floating over your shoulder as though it's also excited to see what's inside. You see... Oh, fuck no! You groan. The box opens, and within you see something tr truly heinous that it makes you recoil in disgust. For context, years ago, you had a thing for clowns. You had no idea where it started, but your dad was all about it, to the point that your young mind thought he was a clown instead of some scruffy, cube-dwelling business shithead. And now, years later, your dad still thinks you like them, apparently, because within this box is the cheerful face of a life-sized Harlequin plush. Your blue orb's chimes get more aggressive upon seeing the Harlequin's horrible grinning mug. Right? Even you think this sucks, buddy. You say as the orb approaches the doll. You look up at the mantelpiece at your Nana's smiling visage. 
Are you seeing this shit, Nana? You ask sarcastically. Then, suddenly, all hell absolutely breaks loose. In a blinding baby blue flash that makes you recoil in pain, rubbing your eyes, the orb seems to absorb the fucked up Harlequin doll. To your horror, your newest friend, your precious orb, becomes one with the clown before your very eyes. No! You stammer weakly, blinking in bewilderment at the outcome of this holy creation. The clown orb. The orb now has a smug, <laughs> grinning clown face on it, and all that's left of the doll is its left arm, sitting forlornly inside of the box, oozing stuffing. Orb! You cry with dismay. However, instead of chiming at you like before, the orb begins to obnoxiously honk at you in a deafeningly <laughs> jolly cacophony of invisible horns. You fumble for your PDA and blindly beg Rose for help, but help never comes. Rose! Rose, do you see the clown? The only thing for it is to run from the honking madness into the garage. Dad, you cry, but oddly, your dad isn't there. You blink, looking around, seeing the garage door is open, and your father is on the lawn, staring skyward. Something isn't right. The irritated panic you felt before fades away into something new. Your dad looks serious, not just his usual tacit self, but worried. Your dad shouldn't look worried. He's your dad. There's an odd light cast over the lawn, orange and dim, like something blocking the sun. You slowly approach your father, afraid to look upwards. John. Your dad utters a single word, a baffled word. You look skyward. Above you, looming and flaming overhead, like a god of myth, is a rock, a meteor, an infernal hellish ball of abject doom. You swallow, choking on your words as you gawk. Down the road, you hear screams. In the distance, the peeling of a car out of the driveway. People all over your sunny Seattle suburb are coming out of their homes to look upwards. John, your father says quietly. The calm in his voice sends a chill down your spine, waking you up. We, you stammer. How? Go inside, John, he says, firm and stern. The way he speaks is bone chilling. More screams arise around your block. Mr. Henderson's half mown lawn sits abandoned, mower still running. Mrs. Gunther howls, sobbing to the sky pacing her lawn in a blind panic. Your hands shake. You have to tell your friends. There's a message from Rose. Dumbly, unsure of how to react, you read it. John, did you put the cylinder in the alchemeter? You blink. The game feels so far away now. Just moments ago, you've been excitedly running around, but now, what? Now, you're going to die. Yes, you're going to die. You, John Egbert, are going to die. Your life will stop once that meteor crashes down on your neighborhood. You shake. You begin to breathe heavily. You stumble on a response, confused and suddenly terrified. Rose, you're my best friend. I love you. Please. Answer the question. Something about Rose's sternness slaps sense into you. Rose, the game is over. Something terrible's happened. You squeeze back tears. Your dad has gone inside the garage, leaning on his workbench. Do you want to live? You blink tears from your eyes. You... you do. Your heart thuds. Look at the alchemeter again. You begin to hear something roar above you. It's absurd. A meteor just appearing in the sky above a suburb. It's impossible to react to, it's unfathomable, and yet, it's happening. You look towards your balcony. On it, something glints in the blood-orange light. Something that makes you sober up in a mere moment. You have no doubt that what you're doing is stupid, pointless, and idiotic. Checking on the alchemeter again when a meteor is boring down on everything you've ever known. You pant, rushing past your father, past the fucked up clown in your living room, up the stairs, two at a time, and to the balcony. 
On the Alchemeter platform, where there was nothing before, there is now a tree. Not a tree of bark, but a tree of blue, crystal, and stone, surreal and otherworldly. Heat buzzes on your neck, and the air is rushing around you, deafening wind kicking up, the whole world turning orange and hot. You don't know how, but this game and this meteor are connected, and that fact gives you a flicker of impossible hope. This game will save you. Up the tree is an apple, made of the same blue crystal and stone that the tree is. A huge apple, as big as your head. In your room, a timer ticks down to the number one. You take a bite of the apple, and just as everything goes too bright to handle, too loud, too hot, everything goes dark and quiet. Your name is Rose Lalonde, how quaint. It is your thirteenth birthday, in one of the worst snowstorms you've ever seen. But you and your mother are out in the yard anyway, standing before a stone mausoleum, umbrellas catching the gently falling snow. He was a good kitty says your mother. You nod, the tears freezing on your face, sniffling in cold air as you shiver. Jaspers von Delight III. Your pet black cat died the previous night, put to sleep by the vet as a mercy to save him from the trauma after falling into the river. How he got that is a mystery, as he'd been missing for several days. You don't quite understand it yet, but you know to feel sad. Emotion often comes before understanding, a fact brought into stark relief by the way the mausoleum makes you feel. He was the best, Kitty. You affirm. For the first and last time in your life, you willingly reach for your mother's gloved hand and hold it. Roxanne had a flair for the extravagant, and when she had a stone tomb built for your cat, you didn't know what to think. It felt like another empty gesture, another over-the-top emotionless farce to trick you into believing she was a good mother, but it wasn't. Roxanne loved that cat too, and she loved you, and you felt that, for the first and last time in your life. Five years later, in April, you're traipsing to that mausoleum again, since that snowy day Full of the bitterest sweet love, you found out the mausoleum you'd felt so much love towards had just been another of Roxanne's ploys. She'd built it in the one place she knew you wouldn't mess with, under your dead friend's tomb. You scowl as you approach the tomb, sliding open the heavy door. Moments ago, you'd narrowly escaped death by meteor, and to your dismay, it didn't look like that was a one-time thing. As you emerged from the observatory, the domed roof dented by the impact of a space rock, you looked skyward only to see the rain dotted with orange boulders, flaming and raining down as hard as the water droplets. You grit your teeth, and now you're here, sneaking into Mom's stupid hideout. You shove your cat's coffin inside, revealing a ladder down into your mother's lab, a place you've always wanted to explore which now feels empty. You're not stupid. You can draw conclusions. You've known forever. Feelings come before reason, and you feel strongly that this game and these meteors are connected. While your laptop is out of commission, you're unable to check, but you've learned all you can about the game in what little time you've scraped together. You have a feeling knowing what you do might save your life, and more importantly, your friends. What's more, Jade's cryptic hints are coming in handy recently. Eerily so. You can't question that for now, only decide to follow them. Once inside the lab, you look around. What you see first is a large grid. To the west, you hear water rushing past machinery, no doubt the hydro generator under your home. Concrete walls secure the basement in place, while outside the rain and meteors are the distant thundering thud. You scour for an outlet. This basement area is massive and flat, strange green bricks lining the floor. In the center of the lab, there is an odd-looking raised section of the floor, and on the walls there are massive science contraptions of which you have no inkling. 
Odder still, cat food is piled in the corner. Inspecting the green bricks, you see that each one is outfitted with an outlet. Curious, you pluck one from the ground. It slides out of its tessellated place in the floor and hums in your hands. Odd. A self-contained power source. You silently hope this won't give you cancer down the line as you plug your laptop in, inspecting the largest monitor, a ceiling-high computer screen with a map of the United States with colored dots all over it. Jade, we need to talk. Oh. Um. Okay, Rose. I need to know what you know about this game. Oh, jeez. I guess you believe me now? Yes. A number of your tips have paid off. I wish I could help more, Rose. It's just... I get... feelings about things. And my feeling right now is you should talk to Dave, okay? He installed his server copy, so he'll be able to get you in. All right. I'm... Really sorry. I will explain everything soon. I just need more time. Very well. Jade said to talk to Dave, so talk to Dave you shall, even though you'd prefer not to. Yo. Dave, Jade said you installed the server copy? I'm going to connect to you presently. Whoa, buy me dinner first, Lalonde. Shut up, weirdo. Dave is being... Dave. Uncooperative, but ultimately trustworthy. According to him, things topside have gotten rather dire. You switch your view to John's house, seeing his empty room, broken crux truder and all. You zoom out and your fears are confirmed. You can't look upwards, but the orange-red tint tells you all you need to know. John, did you put the cylinder in the alchemeter? You leave that to him to find later. No time now. Your own goose will be cooked if you don't hightail it fast. Okay, done. That was like pulling teeth. They're both in my room? Um... Just tell me where they are. I'm about to be on the move. Well, the roof... You're dead to me. You snap your laptop shut and put it back into the ziplock. The green cube will be handy, so you stuff that in too, even though you can't close it all the way now. No time to worry about that. You take a deep breath, ready to climb out of the secret entrance when you hear a soft, slurred voice. Rosie? Another exit to your west, a light shines down into the dim lab. Your teeth clench. Mother. You stay silent, but you can't make it back to the entrance. Mom will see you in this wallless room. You don't know what your mom has been doing down here, and you don't have time to ask, even though the curiosity burns inside you. You decide to speak, sternly, like a woman who had to raise herself. Your drunk mother, stay out of my way. Your voice is cold, but you feel it has to be. You don't have time to wrangle your drunk mom today. It's okay. I know you'd come down here sometime. It's starting. Starting? You blink, forgetting your sopping wet, rain-soaked appearance for a moment. What's starting, mother? You ask, voice a little less stern. End of the world, she says solemnly. She traipses calmly down the stairs in a lab coat and slippers, shuffling towards you. Roxanne points to the screen that towers above everything else. See that, pumpkin? She says, taking a slow, drunk breath. That's the United States. Each itty bitty dot. She pointed to each dot in turn. All told, they nearly covered the entire surface of the states, leaving little space for the map to poke through. Every one of them is a meteor. You swallow. This is what you've been doing? Calculating the end of the world? You say. You sound accusatory, like she caused this somehow. You don't mean to, but you can't take it back either. Yep, she says simply. To get you ready. Two? Questions royal inside your mind. Your mother knew. She had some information about this madness. You huff, beginning to climb the stairs back into your house. You don't have time to find out what's going on. Stay here. It's dangerous up above. (laughs) Lol. Your mother says as you emerge into the living room. The roof. Dave said the machines were on the roof. That should make things easy. 
You just need something to open the crux, Truda. At a loss, you snag your knitting needles. They're metal, so maybe they can pry it open. You pry the needles from a little crocheted Cthulhu plushie you made, and find yourself patting it on the head. We're really in the shits now, Princess Cthulhu. You say. On a whim, you decide to grab her along for the ride. The rain hasn't let up, meteors coming down in higher numbers. You hear booming thuds all around you, one landing in your backyard with a mighty slam, making you ah! yelp. Most of your roof is flat, with a decline towards the sides, so traipsing towards the machines Dave put up is an easier trek than going up the stairs to the observatory. Princess Cthulhu is set down on the Cruxtruder's flat edge, and you take note of the timer. Five minutes. Not ideal. You have a feeling that the countdown isn't for when the tube opens like you first thought with John. Your feeling now is that once it runs out, it's game over, as it were. You pry the cap off with a mighty push, impressed that your needles withstood such force. Shaking your wrists, you fish out the cruxite cylinder with relief. Now, just to put it in the alchemeter on the other side of the roof. Your best laid plans, however, are foiled by a sudden noise causing you to jump. Over your shoulder, an orb floats, making insistent, tinkling bell-like noises at you. Ah! You cry out, hands clumsily dropping the cylinder, which rolls alarmingly fast towards the edge of the roof. No! You growl, feet slipping as you chase the errant tube. The good news is, the tube isn't washed away. The bad news is, it's now sitting at the riverbank below. You grit your teeth and change course. You run indoors, huffing as you dash. God, you're not in great shape. Just a rainy jog is winding you, and the cold is starting to seep below the skin, but you can't stop now. Getting that tube is your ticket out. You huff, snagging the tube in your arms. You see the mystery orb floating on the roof. That must be the sprite, the kernel. The game mentioned that. Something about prototyping it. You wish you had time to read more of the in-game explanations, but you're under a crunch here. You don't have the foggiest idea what the fuck that meant. Back on the roof, you're wheezing. You don't have time to rest, hoofing it up to the alchemeter, slotting the cylinder into place. At first, nothing happens, and for a long moment, fear builds in your chest, but suddenly, into existence, something pops. A pink-colored bottle. Just a bottle. It's empty, but it's clearly there, for a reason. What reason? You, you don't know. You scream at the sky. Fuck! Fuck this! You scream more. Your voice hurts and water gets into your mouth, but you're good and properly sick of this shit. You pace, grabbing the bottle and Princess Cthulhu, your Colonel Sprite following you indoors. You eye the countdown. Two minutes. Hands shaking, you open the laptop. There's a message. It's John. Oh, God's alive. John. He's even more fucked than you. You need to know if he somehow solved a stupid alchemeter puzzle. Maybe it would give you a hint. Then again, he seemed rather shaken. Understandably, you admit to yourself. You're a little overwhelmed at how grimly calm you feel right now. You gaze at the bottle, searching in vain for some scrap of information. All the in-game guide says is so teeth-grindingly cryptic. 1. Deploy Crux Truder. 2. Extrude Totem. 3. Prototype Sprite. 4. Alchemize Totem. 5. Enter. Half of those phrases don't even contain proper words. They're sentence fragments at best, ones that belie less meaning than the Jabberwocky. You want to throw your computer, not knowing things, being in the dark. It's just so, so... You leave your laptop. Enter, what the fuck does that mean? Enter, enter. You pace, watching the clock. 30 seconds, your throat is tense, your mouth is dry, your eyes are wide. You can't take it anymore. You explode, throwing Princess Cthulhu at the incessant tinkling of the orb, taking the bottle in your hand and just letting go. The bottle sails towards the river as you slowly realize what you've done. Not thinking, not breathing, your sneakers squeak on the roof, and you find yourself leaping from it, arms outstretched for the bottle. You just toss to the wind. Against all odds, your fingers close around it as you suddenly, instinctively understand what needs to be done. You feel the, the sharp burn of your body entering the river lopsided. You'll hear the impacts of meteors, the hum of the generator, the howling of the wind, and the pelting of the rain. And as your howling voice joins the chorus, you press the surface, your arm cranks back, and you bring the bottle down, 
on a stone from the shore. And with that final deafening shatter, the noise stops. The river stops carrying you. The water flows around your motionless body as you lose consciousness. The last thing you feel are someone's arms embracing you. Mother? You blink. A pink and white specter wraps you up, and you're gone. Your name is Jade Harley. You are, particularly for your age, jacked. Island living has made your arms ropey and your legs thick, like an Olympian. Your sun bronze skin is painted with several scars, all of which you're proud of. Your shoulders are your most striking feature, broad and strong. They look like massive oaken shelves, especially when you're wearing your sleeveless tanks, which you basically always are. At six foot six, you don't look like any other 18-year-old girl, and if anyone saw you, they'd surely remark on it to no end. Luckily for you, other people seeing you is not an issue. Despite your friend's skepticism, you live on a deserted island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in a research lab owned by your grandfather. In fact, it's the only life you've ever known. Presently, you're in the compound's greenhouse, humming to yourself merrily, watering the flowers. You have a feeling you don't need to be doing this, but you have a routine. You have lots of strange feelings. Something feels off today, and you know perfectly well why. Today is the day the world ends. That's why the flowers don't need to be watered. They won't be here tomorrow at all. You set down the watering can, pushing your glasses up your face. All morning you've been hearing about the game you're set to play with your three friends, but you have yet to actually play it. The reason for this is quite simple. You don't have a copy of the game to play it. You have a feeling you will, but you're not sure how. A lot of things in your life are like that. You move outside onto the flat, sunny field you've played in since you were a child, the world's biggest front yard. You'd play with your dog Beckwell and your grandpa for hours, then come inside for some fresh veggies and a soup grown with your help. You wonder where Beck is today and hope he's snoozing, mostly because you have to give him the slip. The island in which you live is shaped like a rough crescent, meaning that in the middle there's a rather striking lagoon, covered in massive lily pads, all leading towards a temple your grandfather came to this island to study. You've always wanted to go in yourself, but your dog Beck, on your grandpa's orders, makes sure you don't meander in. What a good dog, even though today it's a nuisance. You walk towards the lily pads, creeping quietly as you plan your heist. You'll hop from one lily pad to the next, then climb up the side of the ruins to the entrance using the stairs. The ruins have loomed over this island since you were a little girl, and you've always felt oddly comforted by the stone frog statue that sits on top of them. In fact, today you wave at the big fella. Mr. Froggy, you'd call him in your younger days. You look around, squinting. No Beck. It's go time. Sadly, as you take that first hop onto the lily pad, the jig is up. Before you materializes Beck in a crackle of green energy. Did you mention that your dog can teleport himself and other objects? Sorry, that kind of little insignificant detail slips your mind. Beckroll woofs quietly, nosing you in the chest to say, go back. Beck! You whine. Look, I know Grandpa said, but I need to. Beck gives you a warning snort, but you're not backing down from some extra-dimensional pooch. Again, sadly, you don't stand a chance and you feel the familiar sensation of being teleported into the den of your home, in front of the fireplace, facing your grandfather. Beck barks, announcing to Grandpa in no uncertain terms that you've just been doing something naughty. Your cheeks flush. Pops! You say apologetically. I just needed to get into the ruins, okay? Your rules suck, and I know you're just trying to keep me safe, but I'm an adult now, and I'm going to the mainland soon. You huff. Whoops. Got a little heated. You look up to your grandfather, who stands motionless. This is normal, as he is a taxidermized corpse. Did you forget to mention that? Sorry, that kind of little insignificant detail slips your mind. Beck seems satisfied with the apology and zaps away as quick as he came. Oh no, if you want to get into those ruins, you'll need a distraction. You head upstairs to your room, foregoing the stairs and opting for the transportalizer instead. The compound is about 20 stories tall, and topped with a round tip in which your bedroom is. It used to be a general living quarters, but since your grandpa passed away, it's just yours. 
While you cook up a scheme to trick Beck, you decide to talk to some of your friends. You love your friends. Dave, John, and Rose are dear to you more than they could ever know. They made a life of isolation bearable, something which you could never hope to repay. But today is someone's special day. Happy birthday, June. June? Haven't you called me that before? Whoops. <laughs> uh, John, sorry. <laughs> June is another one of my friends. Yeah, if I was born a girl, June would have been a cute name. Not that I ever think about stuff like that. <laughs> right. What's this June like, anyway? Are they on the VG Facts forum? I don't think so. Then how did you know them? Aren't you, like, on an island? Well, if I tell you, you'll laugh. <laughs> Probably not. You've told me all kinds of weird crap. I don't like laughing at my friends. Unless it's due to a prank, which is cool. June is one of my friends in the Gold City. Yeah, your Gold City dreams. <laughs> yeah, I love Prospect. Sounds like a cool place. It is. I love it so much. So June is one of the little white bald guys? The Prospidians? No, she's a human, like us. I've never actually seen her awake. So she's uh, asleep in your dreams? Do you think she's dreaming inside your dreams? <laughs> no way. Dreams in dreams is a dumb idea. What gave you that inception? Well, fair enough. Well, I hope June wakes up soon. Me too. You'd better check your mail soon, June. John. <sighs> <laughs> okay, Jade. See you later. Let's play Spurb together, okay? Of course. All right. Time to get down to business. How will you outfox your pup? Living on an island isn't easy. You've had to hunt and grow your own food since your grandfather died when you were 13, after all. Being a survivalist is one of your points of pride, but it's not exactly a pleasant way of life. On the other hand, you do have certain amenities due to your pop's connection to Skynet systems. One of said amenities is a cookalyzer, a handy green cube that can cook food in moments using quantum cookalizing technology. You hope this won't give you cancer down the line. From your table, you snag your trusty cookalizer, opening it up and placing a steak inside. You feel a little forlorn. Meat on the island is hard to come by. You have to travel up the foot of the mountain nearby to find any game, but this is worth it. You crank the cookalizer up the dial. Sear, cook, burn, and finally, irradiate. Nothing a nuclear pooch likes better than a glowing irradiated steak. Oh, but Beck would make short work of this. For now, you hold off on cookalizing, instead walking to your transportalizer. Yes, perfect. Beck would need to be given the runaround for this plan to work. You feel a little bad doing this, but as the world was going to end soon, you don't have much need for the transportalizers anymore. This definitely will not come back to bite you. You open the control panel and give the thing a good whack. This has the intended effect, which is for the machine to go on the fritz and trap anything that it attempted to transportalize between the two portals, one at the bottom of the stairs, one at the top. The effect would essentially render the device worthless, but Beck would be able to smell the steak, meaning he'd be trying to look for it for a while. You begin cookalizing, cupping your mouth and calling, Beck! Come and get your grub! As you finish the cooking, the pooch materializes on cue, tail furiously wagging. As you tug the green glowing steak from your cookalizer, you toss it into the transportalizer. Everything works like a charm. The steak is torn apart on the atomic level, making Beck whine with confusion, cocking his head and sniffing the machine as the steak flickered curiously out of existence. Oh, you feel horrible for fooling your pooch, but some things need to be done for the sake of progressing. You withdraw your trusty spring-loaded grappling hook, one of your very first DIY inventions, aiming it directly at the ruins. A cable zips out and embeds itself onto the side of the frog's head. You wince. Sorry, Mr. Froggy, you say as you Laura Croft your way down the wire towards the ruins. No need to evade Beck now that he's occupied. Still, it's only a matter of time before he recorporealizes his snack, so you'll have to act fast. You're dismayed that you can't check the ruins more intently today. After all, this is the first time you're here. But you can't pause as you rush down the dark hallways lined with frog hieroglyphs, carved intricately in smooth stone. The ruins, it seems, are fairly straightforward, consisting only of a hallway ending in a spacious cavern room. As you enter, you look around in awe. 
This place might not be the maze-like catacombs you envisioned, but it's huge. And in the middle, there's what appears to be a massive blossom. In your pocket, your phone has been buzzing. No doubt messages from friends. Ever the diligent pal, you decide to answer them as you approach the blossom. When you reach the strange flower, it's apparent that this isn't a flower at all. It's some kind of capsule in the shape of a blossom with a countdown clock. You cock your head reading the display. Only 10 seconds more. I hope it's not a bomb or something. You mutter, keeping an eye out for Beck. Still, this is odd. When did the blossom get here? Its base is the same color as the stone making the ruins, but there's no way it's of the ruins. After all, the countdown clock is digital. Did Grandpa build this? Your curiosity gets put on hold as the timer ends silently. What happens next awes you even more. The flower opens slowly, revealing in the center a glowing white orb which slowly materializes into envelopes. Specifically, two envelopes, each labeled Spurb with Dave scrawled in red underneath. You're not too sure what happened, but you decide to thank Dave for his contribution. Dave, thank you so much. Tight. What for? For your game discs. My who now? I don't know how you got them to me, but I somehow got your sperb copies. Okay. How's that? They were in a flower. Oh. Okay. Well, sick. Either way, uh, you could play with the three of us. Just, uh, be careful. Fucky shit is afoot. John and Rose haven't been seen in a while, and a crow stole my client copy. Oh no! It's lucky you told me to install the server software earlier. Otherwise, it'd be in the crow's clutches. Yay! I had a feeling. You and your famous feelings. Your feelings saved my ass from a massive fucking headache. Wait, do I still need to get my shit back from the crow? Crows suck ass, man. People are all like, crows are smart. And sure, they can like, open nuts and shit by dropping them in the road, but... Can a crow do taxes? I think the fuck not. Well, I've never done taxes either. Bad example. Well, uh, just, uh, let me know when you install them and we can get you hooked up. Okay, Dave. I would get your copy back from the crow first, okay? On it. Man, Dave is so cool. You sigh wistfully. You hear he wears sunglasses indoors. Your celebration comes to an end when Beck materializes, ears laid flat on his head. <laughs> you sheepishly grin. Jigs up. For the second time that day, you find yourself teleported in front of your grandpa to give another apology to his corpse. But Beck doesn't try to take your suburb discs from you. Once the corpse formality is done, you hurry upstairs, now having to take the manual route. In other words, actually ascending actual stairs instead of teleporting. Once in your room, your hands shake, sliding the server disk into your computer. However, no sooner do you hit install than you get a message. A message you'd rather not deal with. You're about to play a cool, fun game with your buddies, and you don't need this Hanyak distracting you. Against your better judgment, you indulge her, just to get it out of the way. Hey, Jade. Huh, I blocked you. Your IP and everything. Oh, not happy to see your old pal, Vriska. Relax. I won't be long. I just have a quick message. Fine. If it'll get you out of my hair faster, creep. Touchy. Whatever. Here's the message. Sleep. No sooner do the blue words appear than you do just that, blanking out completely right onto your keyboard. You are no longer Jade Harley. You aren't anyone, in fact. You're just you again, whoever is reading or listening to the words. You decide to continue reading or listening, or you might decide to stop. If you do continue to listen or read, your eyes and or ears take in more information, read and written by me. Inside a dark upstate New York lab, a drunk blonde woman leans against the wall, cradling a martini full of liquor and regrets. In a Pacific Northwestern suburb, a man is astounded that he hasn't just been crushed by a meteor. 
in a Texas apartment complex, a tall man wearing a ball cap and anime shades bitterly contemplates his failure of a son. And in front of a fireplace somewhere in the Pacific, an old scientist sits stuffed. Across America, meteors crash down, defying explanation. Scientists and pundits won't be able to talk about the apocalypse on the news, as it all happens in what boils down to be an instant. The only few who escape are the lucky few who pre-ordered an innocuous game from a baking conglomerate. Somewhere in Golden Valley, Minnesota, a towering structure watches over the Betty Crocker headquarter campus, and in its highest building, Betty Crocker stands silhouetted against a room-sized window. It's a miracle that the campus hasn't been decimated yet, almost as though this very spot in the Golden Valley was chosen due to being geographically the final place the meteors would strike. Even so, high above the orange glow of the meteors bear down on their location. Ma'am? A voice calls out, a little tense. Betty Crocker looks over her shoulder, five long feet of hair swishing behind her like a raven-colored curtain. Orange-red eyes glare at her assistant, tears of frustration streaking them. Betty Crocker says nothing. We have to go, the assistant insists, and Miss Crocker silently nods. Her heels clack against the ground as she turns away from the imminent wreckage of her company, something she spent a lifetime building. Not her lifetime, of course, but a lifetime nonetheless. Soon after, Betty Crocker Corp. is nothing but a pile of ashes. Soon after that, the entire globe of Earth is gone. April 13th, 2009. 6,840,000 people snuffed out instantly, with precisely eight survivors. Four American 18-year-olds, two men, one woman, and a snow-white nuclear dog. Most apocalypses in fiction you'll find aren't total apocalypses. There would be very little story if this were the case, of course, and the likes of Mad Max and Fallout, and yes, even Waterworld, all see the fight for survival continue after the bombs drop or the meteors fall. But this apocalypse was total. Seeing Earth reduced to a tan ball of horrid, desolate, uninhabitable space. Unless, of course, you could survive on sand. Unless you were some kind of carapist, sand-eating, wayward vagabond. I'll let you know if I run into anyone like that. Barring this, however, Everything died. I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, though. Spoiling a thing or two. I said there are eight survivors, and you've met each and every one now. Perhaps you've even breathed a sigh of relief that your new favorite character isn't actually going to succumb to a horrible death via flaming space rock. But that unease isn't going away, is it? That sense of dread and uncertainty. Why not? Enough of that now. Let's back up, back to where we left off, before the apocalypse. Even though I've ensured everyone that these plucky kids get into the game no issue, we still have to see how they do it, don't we? Because let's face it, things aren't looking great. John and Rose are both missing in action after evading some nasty meteors, Jade is asleep at her desk, and Dave's game is being hoarded by a nasty crow. And do I even need to bring up the clown? Let's find out how our heroes get out of this one. Here's some inside information from Betty Crocker. It's the most exciting thing you can do with the inside of a cake. Your name is Chad Buskin. Oh yeah. You're kind of a normal guy, you think. Normal, but cool. An under-the-radar style of guy. The type of guy who would make a great wingman. You really like this niche for yourself, and you often fondly consider that your ideal role would be as the sidekick of a rom-com protagonist. That might sound weird, but that's just how you roll. Bros before hoes. Also, you wear shitty Weezer shirts. A long time ago, you lived in Texas. 
You still live in Texas, but this place is fucking huge. So now you live in a part that feels different than the part you were in. That's all to say, you live far from your friend, Dave. You and Dave go way back. Like, public school kindergarten way back. When you were both 13, however, you had to move to the panhandle while Dave stuck around in the big city. Thanks to the wonders of the internet, however, you two were able to keep in touch like never before. Even so, it's not like Dave is your only friend. You also have your new buddies. You decide to check in with Buddy Numero Uno, the brains of the outfit, so to speak, the infamous Mike Hawksbig, the founder of the VG Facts forums you all frequent. Mike is a lot older than you are, but you both bonded over a shared love of shitty flash animation and gaming, and the rest was history. It's kind of beautiful that the internet can connect so many people, you think. You know Mike will have all the answers. You and Mike and your other pals will make this game your collective bitch. Mikey, my man. What's the scoop, Snoop? What's up, Ketchup? What's new, Beef Stew? Aren't we slated to play some games today? I heard that you most righteously already got Jack into the game. My man TG has been talking this shit up all day. You wait a moment or two. Odd. Mike isn't responding. Uh, I'll ask Jack. You pivot, speaking to your secondary bud, Jack Offerman. Jack-o'-lantern. Jack attack. Speak to me. You're supposed to get Ionia in the game, right? Reiterate the loop to me, my guy. You wait. Again. No response. You squirm in your computer chair. You decide to switch to the group chat. Hey, guys. Any word? Jack? Mikey? Uh, kind of in the lurch here, fellas. Lol. Chad? It's your final compatriot, Iona Fatpuss. You feel sorry she has such an unfortunate name, but she seems to think it's hilarious. She's in no laughing mood right now, though, from the look of things. Iona, are you in? Yeah. Chad, things are really bad. Bad? Your chest thuds. Dave mentioned this game was dangerous. That's silly, though. Games can't be dangerous. That's TV show shit. I haven't heard from the guys. I'm freaking out, dude. Just relax. What happened to them? So, basically, we got into the game. Mike took the lead and tried to get Jack in, but, uh, Jack said he hasn't heard anything from him. Oh. So Jack tried to get me in, right? And I'm in the game, but now Jack is missing. I think they both couldn't get in. Wait, so Mike and Jack aren't even in? Just you? That's bad, though, dog. The loop is supposed to go Mike, Jack, you, me, then I get Mike in. Fuck, it's really confusing. And there's also the ghost. A ghost? Yeah, there's some kind of fucking spooky phantasm, dude. It's fucked up. I'm straight up frightened and whatnot, man. Um... You're not entirely sure what to make of that. A ghost? It's my dead puppy Marbles, Chad. The ghost of Marbles. There was this orb, okay, and Marble's ashes, like, went into the orb. Oh, uh, wow, that's fucked up. You're basically not listening right now. Iona is prone to these flights of fantasy, and you're not about to indulge them in this moment of truth. I better get you into the game, though. Yeah. You install the game and get started. Before long, you're inundated with game bullshit. You know, the typical things you, you as in the reader, not you as in Chad Buskin, are accustomed to by now. You, Chad Buskin, not you the reader, head downstairs to find a massive machine in your living room, what Iona calls a Cruxtruder. Fuck, Chad. Still nothing from the guys. How are things holding up, fat puss? The ghost is still around, but now there are also fucking gremlins? This sucks, man. This game sucks. You're really on the fence about this. Iona talks a lot of shit, but at the same time, she just made machines magically appear in your apartment. You eye the countdown clock. 
Something about a ticking timer makes you nervous. What's with the timer? Oh, fuck. Don't let that run out, okay? Find something to get it open. There's, like, a tube inside. Iona's vagueness is bordering on irritating now, especially given how your two other friends are missing wholesale. Could they really be? Your mind's train of thought is obliterated, however, when a meteor strikes the apartment. Your apartment building is small, only housing a dozen or so places, each one with only three rooms each. Shit living, essentially. Perfect for a kid living on his own for the first time. You cough, <coughs> smoke filling your lungs as you gasp for air, looking around. Looks like your immediate area is unharmed. The meteor striking the car park outside. Car alarms forlornly going off en masse as you hear your neighbors panicking. Fuck! You wheeze, looking out the window. In the distance, you hear more impacts, and when you look upwards, your stomach flips. High above you is an oppressive sight. For a moment, you mistake it as a cloudy day, but upon closer inspection, it becomes clear that those brown-red masses in the usually sunny sky over the Texas panhandle are more meteors. The bare sky is barely visible. Ionia. When you entered the game, were there meteors? You wait. No response. Your stomach flips again. Fat puss. Answer! S someone Fear grips you. Fear has gripped you before, and shitty haunted houses are getting called in to see the principal. But those times were different. This is horrible. It tugs at you like fear itself is trying to pry your whole body apart. And what's worse is that it's working. You're not a hero. You're Chad Buskin. You're a wingman, a supporting character. You're not the guy who makes plans or stops the apocalypse. And as you look back inside of the countdown clock, you see the rest of your life ticking down. Five minutes. You aren't going to make it. You were. You're going to die. All you can do is take this final gift, these final five minutes, and do what you do best. Your three friends might be gone, taken by ghosts or meteors or gremlins or what unimaginable horror is out there that didn't exist yesterday. But you have one friend left, older than any of them. You open Pester Chum for the last time. Introducing the Betty Crocker Bacon Fill, a delightful new pan that lets you prepare a cake with all kinds of delicious fillings. Imagine the look on your child's face when you cut into the cake and there's his favorite flavor of ice cream or her favorite gelatin. And who wouldn't enjoy a cake filled with delicious... Your name is Dave Strider, yet again. You can't believe what you just witnessed. On your very own computer screen on a rainy roof, Rose Lalonde, your longtime friend, leapt off her house into a river. You're dumbfounded, slack-jawed, confounded even. What in the entire nation of tar? You stare at the empty roof. You don't have long to stare, because in short order, the screen goes blank for the first time since starting the game, presenting you with a new progress bar and a message. Loading. You don't know what to make of that, but the screen is gone. Without recourse, you consult the group chat. Rose? John? Anyone? No luck. Look, uh, if anyone is out there, I just want to say, you three are my best friends, okay? Well, okay, I have like a fourth best friend who I have more history with, but I love all you in an amount that is significant. Anyway, uh, I think that we might actually die, and, like, that would be fucked up under normal circumstances. Though I guess that dying happens normally. What I'm saying is, we might die as an abnormal product of manufactured motherfucking conditions. Like, we're in that movie, where the guy dies because he gets rained on? Fuck. What movie is that? Uh, Blade Runner, that's the bitch. 
Uh, full disclosure, I don't actually know if that's what happened. He just seemed bummed, and he was dying, and it was raining. That was a pretty good movie, but I could never sit through the whole thing for some reason. I like Harrison Ford better in Indiana Jones and shit. Oh, I wrote a rap about this. Uh, hang on. Harrison Ford, Harrison Ford, taking a vacation to the Norwegian Fjord. Talking to a Wookiee, he can get some nookie. Harrison Ford is one tough ass cookie. Then I've got like a verse ranking the coolness of his different hats. His Indiana Jones fedora, the Stormtrooper helmet are tied for number two. Number one might shock and alarm you. Hi Dave. Um, what the fuck are you talking about? Oh, uh, it was my heartfelt message to all of you, but I got distracted. Oh, shoot, well, continue. Don't let me interrupt, I'm just checking in. But for the record, he didn't die because he got rained on. The Blade Runner man? How did he die? I don't know. I didn't watch the whole thing either. I think he might have died because Harrison Ford made really bad origami. Huh. Well, the more you know. Hey, uh, not to rush anything along, champ, but, uh, shouldn't you be getting into the game? Ah, oh, fuck. As usual, John's advice is sage as it is timely. You feel yourself blush, wishing you could delete messages, but since it's 2009 and you're all using IRC, that's impossible and probably will be forever. To follow John's advice getting into the game, however, you'll need your other disc. The other disc that was tragically stolen by a crow recently. Crows, in your experience, are bitches. Shit-headed fuckers who just steal objects, and you can't abide that. You know just where its nest is, too, on the little radio tower on your roof. Dodging your bro, you hope, you head to the roof. Sure enough, the smug Corvid is peeking down at you like the fuckwad he is. You holler something, shaking your fist as you consider how to outfox it. I got some birdseed down here, look. Dave. Rose, holy fucking Christ on the ever-loving cross. You jumped off the roof. I did. Would not recommend. <sighs> Noted. I'm glad you're okay. Somehow. I am too, if you'd believe it. What's Jade's status? She has the game, apparently. I gave her my discs. Or something. I don't follow. Yeah, I don't either, so... Hey, uh, do you think Jade is, uh, a crow, Rose? A crow just took my discs, and Jade said she got them. I doubt it. The girl speaks in riddles. There's probably some explanation she's not even privy to. Wow. Aren't you, like, a skeptic? I thought you didn't take stock in Jade's BS. Times change. You should know. Right. Well, I'm gonna climb a radio tower. Don't do that. Dave? Dave? Somehow, you can feel Rose facepalm. You grip the metal rungs of the tower, tugging to make sure they support weight. You're not a huge fan of this, but you're not getting those things down any other way. The crow seems to detect you have designs on the discs, because it begins to irritably caw at you, swooping for your face. You fall down the little ways you just climbed, grumbling to yourself. Jackass bird. It's clear you need a weapon. You know just the thing. One of bro's ornamental katanas. You know he wouldn't care if you dragged a weapon to the roof. He'd probably assume you were training. So you grab one, post haste, beginning your ascent once more. <sighs> Piece of shit bird. Take my precious video games. You mutter, edging up the tower, swiping clumsily at the bird as it swoops. This crow really hates your guts, it seems, and for your trouble, you get more than one peck mark. Hope this doesn't give you bird flu down the line. Ha! Huh. You grab the discs once you're up, but getting down is the second half of the issue. Not only this, but in your grabbing, you happen to knock the bird's whole nest down too, which, predictably, made it angry. Fuck! You slip down a rung, heart hammering as the crow caws and dive bombs. You probably look like a real dipshit up here getting attacked, clutching a computer game. Annoyed, you give another swipe, but to your dismay, the sword leaves your hand and... Oh, oh no. Crunch. The sword lands on the ground right next to the dead bird. You wince. You didn't mean to kill it. You hop down the remaining feet, crouching over the corpse. You said you hated crows, but now you just feel bad, picking up the katana and resheathing it. Well, you got what you came for. Jade, I've got the goods. Time for you to get me in. Jade? Jade's MIA. 
You wonder what the hell's keeping her as she seemed pretty excited a bit ago. You open the door to the stairwell and gasp in shock. Two for flinching, says your bro, socking your arm two times. What are you doing? A bird stole my game, you say simply, averting your gaze and rubbing the spot where he punched. Things are still awkward from earlier. Well, you got it back, he says, nodding towards the discs in your clutches. Now scram, I'm gonna train up here. You nod, happy to escape his notice. Inside, you hastily install the client software, blowing air through your cheeks. You there, champ? Time is now. Still nothing from Jade. What a space case. Uh, dude? You hear bro in the doorway. Oddly, he hasn't chosen to sneak up on you this time. Come up to the roof. You're not sure what this is about, but you nod, following your brother back out on the roof, your stomach turning as bro doesn't say anything. He's acting weird, and that's saying a lot, because he's a weird guy. You decide to try Chad instead. Yo, Chad. You okay? Been a minute. Chad? Fuck. Where is everyone? You run a hand through your hair. On the roof, bro looks down, pointing to the crowd on the ground floor below. Curiously, you peek over the edge, and sure enough, the scene below is strange. Cars piled up end to end on your quiet side street. People running and weaving between the cars trying to escape, hollering and honking aggressively. The fuck? You ask in general. To your surprise, bro's finger tilts skyward. The speck you'd seen a few moments ago on the horizon is no longer a speck. In fact, it's rather enormous, and before you piece together what it is, your heart hammers. The fuck? You repeat incredulously. That's a meteor. It's time, bro says solemnly. His words mean nothing to you, and you can't just stand dumbfounded as you watch the meteor in the sky. You know it's hurtling towards you, but you just can't fathom it. It looks so calm, almost motionless in the bright blue Texas sky. Your phone buzzes. You yank it out. Dave. Fuck Chad. I've been trying to get a hold of you for centuries, my guy. Do you see that? Yeah. You gulp. You know Chad lives in the Panhandle now, where you still live in Talus. If it's visible from where he is, how big is that thing? I think the game brought it here. The game? Spurb? Fucking Spurb? Were the trolls right? Fuck. Fuck. Dave, please relax. You have to get into the game. It's the only way out. What? I don't know why, but that's what people are saying online. Some people are already inside. Chad, that's fucking insane. Didn't NASA see these meteors? Aren't they gonna fucking, I don't know, bl blow them up? This isn't Armageddon, Dave. This is real life. I hate to be a dick about this, but wasting your time fretting isn't gonna save your ass. You have to get into the game. Now. I can't lose you, man. By nature, you're a cool guy. A suave fella. Chad is right. This is no time to break character. You need to calm the fuck down. You already got Rose into the game. So now, it's your turn. I'll meet you there. I promise. Don't get crushed by this fucking bullshit space rock. You understand? Bet. You dash inside, leaping down the stairs towards your room. Bro is off in the living room, tinkering with something, but you don't have time to see what's on his workbench or why he seems to know about what's happening. Jade. Dave! I need to get into the game. Now. Now? Uh, oh, well that's good timing. I just got my copies. Yeah, my copies or whatever. As much as I'd love to devote a paragraph of text to trying to figure out what the fuck you mean and feigning bafflement, we have a job to do. Now. I agree. Even though you did just type way more than you needed. I'm installing the client. Connect to me and install the machines. Yep. Uh, out of curiosity... Is your bro working on something right now? Uh, yeah, but that's not really relevant right now, is it? I don't know. Oh, I see you. Jade's connection to you is evidenced by her picking up your precious turntables. Jade, be careful with those. Fuck, don't just throw shit around. That's how people get beamed. Good point. 
This is super fun, though. It's like The Sims. Don't get into any pools, Dave. I changed my mind. I'm taking chances with the meteor. Okay, okay, okay. I'm going to plunk down the machines. Uh, oops. You read the word oops as you hear a crashing behind you. To your dismay, your precious turntables have been dropped and snapped in twain. You rake your hands down your face, aware that Jade can see you. Oh, God, Dave, I'm sorry. It's fine. We can't worry about that right now. Well, Jade works on placing the machines, you check your friend's group chat. Status report. Status report? Easy there, John Luke. It appears that you're fine. I don't know how after jumping off a roof into the river, but whatever. I got better. Can't you see me on your screen? No time. Have you spoken with John? Negative. I mean, no. He got in before I have, but he hasn't been heard from. Then again, his stupid PDA is notoriously shitty. Jade? Jade is getting me into the game. Yup. Wait, who's going to get me into the game? Ideally, John. Failing that? I don't know. I've done some research on VGFAQs. The forums have become somewhat bogged down due to the predictable panic, but a thread was opened by CG for those who have entered safely. Ugh, I hate that guy. Didn't he get banned? He got better. It appears that once connected, a server-client pair can't unconnect. So we'll have to get someone else in if John can't connect to you, Jade. For now, Dave, you need to get in yourself. Got it. And if I don't see you guys again... Dave? Yeah, Dave. Don't say that. Jade, how much time is remaining on Dave's crux truder? It's the cylindrical machine. I put that on your roof, Dave. Your bro is doing something up there with, uh... A skateboard? The fuck? Jade, the timer. I believe that timer reaching zero is when your corresponding meteor is set to impact. Oh, jeez. Thirty. Like, minutes? No. Seconds. Fuck. Your heart stops beating for a moment. You don't waste time grabbing bro's <laughs> shitty katana and your phone sprinting right back up to the roof where you began. Back on the blacktop, you see your bro, but once again, you can't pay attention to that right now. Your head swivels for the cylindrical machine, and you spot it, the crux truder, just in time for the timer to read. Ten. Ten seconds isn't enough time. You don't even know what to do with this thing. You rush towards it, feeling your legs burn, but all of a sudden, and at last, your brother successfully distracts you. Get down, he howls leaping back from his project. For years, your brother has had a pet project. He's something of an engineer, a skill not flexed in working on his dolls, so instead he focuses them on other things, namely, rocket-propelled skateboard apparatuses, all of which ended in failure. Predictably, the rockets on boards cause too much propulsion, meaning most of his efforts simply end up with the both of you watching helplessly as skateboards careen in unpredictable directions. You used to think this was a pointless hobby, but years of growing more distant with your brother makes you nostalgic for the times you spent with him in empty lots, testing his insane gizmos. It all seems like a memory now. Presently, the rocket board in question careens directly up into the sky. The fuck? you say from the ground where bro tackled you. Your question is answered not with words, but an explosion. High above you, the meteor bearing down on the earth shatters, sending shockwaves through Dallas. Your apartment building rocks, and in the distance, fragments of the meteor crash noisily into buildings. The honks below are now screams of terror. Didn't you ever wonder why I was stockpiling explosives, little man? Your brother asks. The dots connect. The board. The bomb. This was like Armageddon. I didn't know you were stockpiling explosives at all, bro, you say. Shows how much you know, he says. Do your thing. Once again, bro baffles you. You sit up on the roof, tearing your eyes away from the burning hellscape erupting around you. Dave, the clock hit zero. Are you okay? I'm fine. Bro... Blew up the meteor. Um, Dave? Check again. You glance back at the crux truder. 
The countdown has changed, but it's still very much counting. Now reading a measly 121. The fuck? You hiss. What do I do? The process is simple. Four steps, as I understand. Oh my god, five words or less. Break open the Cruxtruder. Bitch. You roll your eyes behind your shades, but comply. There's no mechanism, so you do what you can, shoving your shitty katana between the lid and the tube, using it as a lever to yank. It works, but the shitty katana snaps, landing in the carcass of the crow from before. You wince. You find a slot for your totem, slipping it inside. After a tense moment in which a meteor strikes the apartment next door, something appears on the platform. It's an egg. I see it. What the fuck do I do with an egg? Break it? I had to break my alchemeter item to proceed. No, I'm not breaking an egg. Is there an orb nearby? Uh... You look around. Sure enough, there is. It's orange, the same color as your new egg, which you gingerly hold. The egg is about as big as your head, and the orb, your torso. Should I put the egg in the orb? No, I don't think that'll work. I'm not sure what the orb is, but it's hard to explain. I don't think that it's related to your entry, but it can bring things to life, in a sense. Suddenly, a compulsion overtakes you, your eyes flick into the dead bird you killed. With your sword as a spade, you use the flat of the now broken katana to pick up the bird gingerly. Here, you say to your orb, offering it the bird. Um, Dave, I hate to be that guy, but you don't really have time to play with dead birds, okay? Uh, Dave, there are only 20 seconds left. Stop cradling the egg like you're its mama. Maybe I am its mama. What do you know? Two things happen at once. First, the orb envelops the bird, and second, a meteor strikes your home's AC unit knocking you to the ground, letting the katana and egg fall from your hands, careening in two directions through the air. Another compulsion strikes you. Even though bro always says, keep hold of your weapon, you let it clatter to the ground, diving for the egg, hands outstretched. You don't know why, but you can't let it break. As your chest hits the ground and your glasses tilt askew, you feel your outstretched hands snag the egg, and you let out a breath just in time to see the egg crack open. From nearby, you hear a caw. Not a caw of irritation like you'd heard climbing the radio tower, but a caw of triumph. The crack in the egg isn't a break. The egg is hatching, and the crow is pleased about it. But wait, the crow should be dead. Before you can consider that, however, tiny shards of meteor begin raining down upon you like hail, stinging your body, your clothes feeling like they're catching fire. You hear the formerly dead crow caw again. In your hands, the egg hatches. After that, everything goes blank. The secret is these three separate sections. Just pour your favorite Betty Crocker cake mix into the main bacon fill pan. Your name is Jade Harley. You're not sure what you just witnessed. The egg in Dave's hands hatched and the screen turned into a loading message. Did he die? Was this the right thing to do? You don't really know. Dave? Did he get in? I don't know. Well, all we can do is hope, I suppose. We need to focus on you now, Jade. We either need to find other players or get you in via John and finish the chain. Uh, I hate to suggest this, but... Maybe those dumb trolls. They're mean, but they seem to know how to play. I'd rather not tangle in their business, but on the other hand, death. Though we can't get a hold of them. I can. One talked to me earlier. You scroll down to a name. Arachnid's Grip. They don't usually talk much on the forums, but they've bothered you a number of times in the past. The most recent message strikes you as odd, though. Jade, if you've spoken to one, ask. If John doesn't appear, it might be our only shot. Jade? Oh, sorry. I, I was just looking for the contact. It's weird, though. One of them told me to sleep. Like, they said it like a hypnosis command or something. Like, they were trying to bewitch you through the computer? Uh, sort of. But it was right before I took a nap, which was weird. 
A coincidence, probably. You're a scientifically minded girl, so normally you'd agree with Rose, but something strikes you as odd. An inkling. You get a lot of odd inklings, though, so this doesn't bother you. You decide to see it through to its conclusion. Have you installed your client software yet? Yes. I'm sorry to ask, Jade, but we don't know how much time you have. Do you see any meteors? Not yet. You look skyward. Just a sunny, cool spring day. A breeze in the air, a crispness of seawater on the wind. Wait, that's weird. What? I can see something in the sky. A meteor? No, some kind of green design? The breeze stops. Your world suddenly still. The entire sky over your island suddenly goes black. Like a hole opened up in it, torn asunder by some massive force. And through that hole in the very sky, a meteor emerges, beginning to furiously burn as the atmosphere shoves against it. Jade? Jade, talk to me! Okay, I see a meteor now. You waste no time, typing to AG hurriedly. Hey! Well, 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 well. Ah, that's too many wells. It's just enough. Eight wells, the ideal well amount. Why the hell are you talking to me anyway? I thought you hated my guts. You're not turning pitch for me, are you? <laughs> I don't know what that means, but if it's sexual, stop. I need your help with the game. The game? Oh, scrub, you mean. No, I mean suburb, dummy. Ugh, dummy? How am I ever going to recover from that insult? Are you a fucking wiggler? Sorry, I can't help you there. And frankly, if I could, I don't know if I would. You kind of mess things up for us, royally, you know? I still haven't gotten an apology for that, by the way. What the fuck are you talking about? Ice cold, Harley. Mm. Wait, what? How, how do you know my name? Ugh, just take a nap already. Sleep. And just like before, you do just that. Slumping in your chair, blackness taking over your vision as your eyes lazily shut. Jade? Jade, Christ, where is everyone? I'm back. Sorry. What's the haps, chaps? Never mind. I want to be alone again. Your name is Jade Harley. You awaken with a start in your bed. You were having your dream again. The one about living on an island on some other planet. Good morning, Miss Jade. A cheerful voice calls out from nearby. It's your retainer, Ms. Paint. Ms. Paint, of course, is a carapacean, a small humanoid white-shelled creature who inhabits the city on which you live, the thriving gold metropolis of Prospit. Miss Paint! You cry, taking a fresh robe from her. Oh, you were having another nightmare, weren't you, love? The assistant says worriedly, wringing her hands. You nod. Well, you are awake now, love, Miss Paint says, bustling about the place. Prospitians are so curious, but since you awoke on this planet as a girl, you've loved spending time with them. Up, up, Miss Paint insists. You've already spent 13 years in that bed. We can't have you sleeping more now, dear. You giggle, hopping up slipping on your robe. Like all humans, you came to Prospit as a baby, soundly sleeping, materializing from the sky and descending to the ground. How else would babies be made? You're one of two humans on the entire planet, both of you occupying a tower on the moon, which you call your home. You visit the other human often, but she's still asleep. The Carapacians call her June, and you know she is your sister. I think this might have been one of my prophetic dreams, Miss Paint, you say. Your memories of your sleeping self are always fuzzy, but you squint, trying to hold on to the recollection. Oh my! Miss Paint hastily hands you your notepad. Your gold-bound dream journal. You write down in a messy scribble, handing it back to Miss Paint. Need to talk to John, she reads your handwriting. Who's John? I don't know. You don't mean June, do you, dear? 
She's been asleep for 18 years. Miss Paint puts her hand to her cheek. Oh, the poor thing. Nightmares all the while, too. Miss Paint closes the journal, putting it safely under her arm. I think we should bring this to the White Queen. Uh, oh. You fidget. The White Queen, the monarch of Prospit. You've met her a few times, but she intimidates you quite a bit. So serene and feminine. If anyone would know this John fellow, it's her. Miss Paint grabs your hand, tugging you down the stairs, huffing. Need a hand? You offer. If it's not a burden, milady. Miss Paint squeaks sheepishly. You giggle and squat so she can climb onto your back as you simply leap through a window. Naturally, you begin to float. After all, all humans can fly. Duh, why would it be any other way? With Miss Paint pointing you the way, you fly across the great gold chain connecting Prospect to its moon, gazing up at Skya above you, sighing wistfully. For some reason, you love flying. Even though it comes naturally to you, it always feels so invigorating. Prospect streets are, as usual, bustling and friendly, full of white-shelled carapaces waving up at you. Ms. Paint waves back to a few. High above, Skya, the great blue orb suspended in black space, shines down. Skya, of course, is the source of all your world's energy and riches, but the horrid forces of Durs are always trying to steal it. Lots of meteors today, Ms. Paint says warily. Dursite forces sometimes send meteors to damage Skya, but Skya has an impeccable system of protecting itself, opening portals to swallow them up. You look Skyward. Sure enough, there are a lot of meteors going through today. You frown. There's one especially massive portal open, a blue spirograph pattern seeming to open up a rift in space itself. For some reason, this reminds you of your dream. Before you awoke, the biggest meteor I've ever seen went through. Miss Paint wrings her hands. But, but I'm sure Skya will be fine. Taking a curious tone, she squirms in your arms. Where do you think those meteors go? To this, you shrug, but the question feels... uneasy. You continue to fly, deciding to put such thoughts out of your head. You light on the steps before the Queen's palace. Guards straighten up upon seeing you. We have business with the Queen, says Miss Paint authoritatively. You stifle a giggle. She only comes up to your waist, and yet she's so much more confident. The White Queen is gone at the moment, madam, one guard says politely, his carapace creaking as he breathes. Gone? Miss Paint bristles as the guard recoils. Again, you manage to stifle a giggle. S Sorry, madam, but she has been out all day. Queenly duties. Well, the Witch of Space needs to get a message to someone named John. It's dreadfully important. Miss Paint demands, waving your journal in the guard's face. The Witch of Space. Since you woke up, people have called you that. They are not entirely sure what it even means. Whenever someone says it, it makes you a little shy, like it's a rank you don't yet deserve. A message, the guard seems to lighten up. We can handle any message. We shall have our post minister on the job as soon as we can. We've just appointed a new one to boot. The guard claps his hands, booming voice carrying over the street. Bring out the post minister, he cries. In the distance, someone shouts an echo. Bring out the post minister. All down Bring the line. The In short order, the alleged post minister comes forth, though she seems somewhat uh, nervous. This is our trusty new PM, the guard cheerfully says, slapping the tall, thin post minister on the back who stumbles forward a little. She shakes your hand, then Miss Paints. Go on, dearie. Tell the PM what you need, says Miss Paint as you gawk at the Carapacian lady. R right you say. Your mouth feels dry, even though the post minister looks just as nervous as you. Can you tell John to... You squeeze your eyes shut, trying to remember. To talk to me as soon as he can. You hope that's not too vague, but by the nervous expression on the PM's face, it looks like it might have been. She opens her mouth to reply, but the eager guard claps her on the back again and hustles her back into the castle. Well, Jade? Miss Paint says expectantly. I... I think that'll be fine. You say hastily. You feel horrible, inconveniencing that poor post minister. She already looked so nervous. But even still, you do feel like it's a load off. As you grab Miss Paint and fly back to your tower, though, you still have a feeling like there's something, 
you've forgotten. Your name is John Egbert. You're currently in your closet, clutching a hammer to your chest for dear life. You don't know what the fuck is going on, but you don't like it. Shortly after taking a bite out of the weird blue apple, something happened. The meteor is gone, leaving your house intact, but on the other hand, you're fairly certain that monsters have just begun to appear. The last thing you saw before you could so much as get your bearings was some kind of terrifying, child-sized thing with claws and teeth climbing up your balcony. Since then, you've been silently hiding inside your closet. You can hear him out there. The creep, the imp, whatever he is. He's breathing heavily, all monster-like, giggling to himself like a little scamp. Are you in the game now? Is this an enemy? If you die in the game, do you die in real life? With resolve, you grit your teeth. You can't just hide in here forever. You peek out the closet door, and what you see makes your blood boil. The creature, whatever it is, appears to be dripping with some black sludgy substance, and he's getting that gunk all over the con air bunny your friend Rose just got you for your birthday. Hot anger sears away, cold fear, and you kick open the closet door, mightily swinging your hammer. Put the bunny back in the box, you shriek, and before the imp can react, your hammer clubs him on the head, and he explodes into oil. Pant, wiping oil off your face and placing the aforementioned bunny back in its box. On the ground, where the imp once stood, are what look to be fruit gushers and a small slip of paper. Sweet, you cry, reaching for the gushers. Loot! The gushers, sadly, disappear as soon as you touch them, almost as though this was some kind of game currency. Damn, you were looking forward to something sugary. Ooh, maybe there are some actual gushers in your kitchen. Your fist tightens around the hammer. You can't let those imps get to your treasure. The card, on the other hand, doesn't disappear, and though it's oily, you can clearly read what it says, which baffles you somewhat. In plain, pristine handwriting, it says, John, talk to me as soon as you can, from the Witch of Space. You blink. You don't know who the Witch of Space is, but you know just what to do. You sit back down at your computer, wiping some stray oil from the screen. Guys! John, thank goodness. John, fuck, you're alive. Yeah, I'm pretty stoked about that, honestly. First meteors, now little imp guys. Imp guys? We can't get sidetracked. You need to connect to Jade right now. Oh, right. Uh, is Jade here? No, she's MIA. But her computer has the client application installed. Connect to her and place the machines. What are these other machines, anyway? There are other machines that you can put down in the game. Other than the alchemeter thing and the totem deal, that is. I don't believe we can buy those. We require some resource that we can't access yet. Wait, actually, no, we appear to have 13G. Now. What's G? Not sure. Gold? Gushers? I don't think it's gushers. You don't know that, Rose. Jumping to conclusions like a fucking cat. It's not- Okay, it stands for grist. And by some cosmic coincidence, they do appear to resemble gushers. Nice. I just killed an enemy, and I think that's what I collected. Interesting. So we defeat enemies to obtain gushers. I mean, grist. Lamau. No, you were right the first time. Never mind that now. Looks like 13 gushers can buy a new machine. What's an ectobiologizer? Hey, that's sort of like my screen name. Dave, don't mess with that. I'm gonna plonk one down in your house, Rose. Tell us what it does. Yo, move your computer desk to make room for this bad boy. Uh... Oops. Dave! What? Uh, shouldn't you be connecting to Jade, gentlemen? Dave is right. Even if he did just probably destroy Rose's computer, you install the server copy and in short order, you're connected to Jade. Thanks. You broke my computer. Now all I have is this stupid old phone. Not my fault you didn't get an iPhone. Oh, Rose, I'm sorry for breaking your computer by dropping a massive machine onto your desk nearly crushing you. I don't even need one of those, you idiot. My mother has one in the basement already. Shit, really? How the hell did your mom get something that comes from a game that just came out? I don't know. Look, we need to focus. John, can you see Jade? 
Yeah, she's uh, in what looks like your bedroom. Uh, s sleeping. Don't look in her bedroom. Why not? A woman's room should be private. Too, it looks like you wouldn't know anything about such things. I know stuff about girls. I think about being a girl all the time. Oh my god, no, it's a normal thing to do. All guys think about being a girl, right Dave? Uh... D dave I don't do that, man. Sorry. <sighs> you guys are the worst. Red in the face, you switch to Jade. You need to wake her up, stat. You decide to splash some water on your face. Maybe if you locate the bathroom, you can use a bucket to dump water on her. You zoom out. Whoa, Jade lives in a weird house. It looks like a tower with an orb on the top. You wouldn't know where to begin to find water here. In the distance you see an ocean, but that water is out of range. You zoom back in and your face pales. Guys, there's a monster in Jade's room. Oh fuck, what? The monster is pure white, like a dog, but far different. For starters, its tongue is neon green and it's crackling with what looks like electricity. It's also double Jade's mass. That thing could swallow her. You hastily grab a stuffed squid from Jade's bed and use your cursor to throw it at the beast, who simply blinks and growls at the squid. It begins to bark, pouncing on the squid, tearing it to shreds in its jaws. I threw everything I had at it. It's gonna tear Jade apart. John, calm down. Wake Jade up. You can only watch as Jade blearily awakens by the monster's barks. You need something heavier. You locate a drop-down menu and select two free machines you use, dropping them into Jade's room, trying to squish the beast under it. Frustratingly, it teleports clear out of the way. I'm out of ammo, but Jade is awake. Hang in there, Jade. John, calm down and place the alchemeter and cruxtruder. I tried to, on the monster's head. Unfortunately, your eyes are torn from the horrible sight before you, as nearby, you hear the door creak open slowly. Fuck. I've gotta go. You are no longer John Egbert. You're you again. You the reader, I mean. I don't blame you for wanting to be John Egbert for a little while, to escape your sad, miserable life for a moment or three, but you know what they say. Fun is fun, but enough is enough. On second thought, let's have a bit more fun. A little reward for surviving eight chapters of watching four teenagers fuck around in confusion with a shitty video game. Let's go back in time. Ooh. I don't have a TARDIS or anything, and before you start getting naked, no, it's not the time machine from Terminator either. It's actually kind of boring, as time machines go. It's just the normal kind, the one in written form that allows you to see stuff that already happened. It's fun, though, I, I promise. So here we go, to a one hour in the future. We're also going to the moon as well. So an hour in the future on the moon. An hour in the future on the moon, Betty Crocker stands on the deck of her battleship silently. After escaping from Betty Crocker HQ, things have been tense. From the porthole, she and her assistant can see Earth in the far distance, getting pummeled into dust by countless meteors all raining down from blue portals opening up in the sky. Ma'am, says Betty Crocker's assistant. He's a short man, hair slicked back, standing with his hands behind his back. Miss Crocker is silent, leaning on the porthole as the final meteor strikes near what used to be Florida. What happens now? The assistant says after a lengthy pause. More silence. <sighs> we can't just live on the moon, says the man, irritation building. Why did we even come here? Aren't we going to leave? Go to your home planet or... As soon as the words home planet leaves the assistant's throat, a dark gray-skinned hand shoots out and squeezes tightly around his neck, lifting him up from the ground. He desperately scrambles and chokes, helpless in his boss's grip. Betty Crocker growls, her yellow-orange eyes growing redder and redder, locked on her longtime assistants as she squeezes once more. With a sickening snap, Betty Crocker lets go, allowing the man to fall lifelessly to the floor. For the second time in her life, Betty Crocker was... alone. Not just alone in a room or without her friends, but alone in the entire universe, the last living, breathing thing in all of it. Earth was gone the only habitable planet among the sparse galaxies of this bleak little universe. She knew, because she'd checked. Betty Crocker didn't come from Earth, but that didn't mean she had a home planet either. She used to, but that was a millennia-old memory now. 
Betty Crocker sighed, moving to look out another porthole. The Earth's moon was silver, a beautiful color, but unlike the two moons on her homeworld, Earth's moon was bare. Again, she'd checked. Nothing above or below the surface, no secret aliens or secret bases. What a boring universe. In spite of the loneliness creeping in the cracks on her skin's chitinous plates, Hope wasn't dead quite yet. After all, Earth might have been fucked, but it's not like it was the only one. As a matter of fact, this wasn't the only moon, either. Betty Crocker sat down in the captain's chair of her battleship, tapping her clawed finger on a dial, taking a slow, rumbling breath. From inside her pocket, she produced a small device. It looked like a remote control, long and sleek with a single massive dial on its face. For the past several thousand years, the ancient remote had been set to beta. But had the time come to switch it? <laughs> From her pocket, her phone buzzed. In an empty universe, someone was calling her. She held the phone to her ear. She knew who this was, and she knew he could hear her. She didn't feel like talking to her doctor right now. My dear Miss Pisces. Oh, I hear you're going by Crocker now. My mistake, the doctor said. Miss Crocker didn't respond. Oh, come now. It's been ever so long since we spoke. For you, at least. Aren't you glad to hear from me? Again. The doctor's words didn't sway Betty an inch. Fine, the doctor said. If I had eyes, I'd roll them. You know why I'm calling. It's time to switch. Betty hung up without another word. So it was time, then. She'd finally see the other Earth. The Alpha Earth. In her palm, she held the remote, taking hold of the dial in her free hand. With a shaking fist, she twisted it, hearing a diminutive click as it changed. For a moment, nothing appeared to have happened except for a brief crackle of green electricity coming from the device, but as Betty Crocker looked out the porthole, she saw Earth. Not the barren, sandy, yellow Earth from before, but a blue-green Earth. A new one. A fresh start. A grin spread on her face as she felt her ship rise off the moon's surface, the ship's thrusters scorching the moon's pocked face, setting off for the new planet. From the surface of the silvery satellite, the clown who lived on the moon looked up at the ship in awe. From his perspective, a massive fucking battleship had just appeared and set sail for the planet below. What the fuck? said the clown, cradling a red and green egg under his arm. Sorry, that was my impression of a time machine. The time machine I was talking about earlier was just a metaphor, but I felt a little guilty about not actually having some kind of special effect to go along with it. That's all to say we're moving around again in time, and in space again, and across a universe. In other words, back to normal. Your name is Jade Harley. You awaken with a start in front of your computer, blinking blearily. You were having another one of your prospect dreams. It was a nice one this time, with Ms. Paint. As the memory fades, you rub your eyes, looking towards what awoke you. Back, you say sternly. Aww. With dismay, you pull your alabaster pooch away from your beloved stuffed squids, merchandise from one of your beloved childhood TV shows, The Squiddles. Beck whines, pacing away from the ruined plush. No time to admonish him, though, as you suddenly remember what's going on. Your heart thuds and you snap into gear, looking about your room. Near your bed is a cylindrical machine, and near your workbench is a platform. No doubt these are the machines that get you into the game. Rose mentioned a timer. Sure enough, the Cruxtruder has a half an hour left. Not a lot, but plenty. You've just woken up in a cranky mood, and worse still, you've just remembered that your house and island home is about to be crushed by a meteor the size of Texas. You know it's not really the size of Texas, of course. You're just exaggerating for effect. It's not like you have a Texas-sized ruler to quickly dash up and measure the fucking thing with. The point is, you're in deep shit, and you just woke up to your dog gnawing on your favorite stuffed animal. Beck, you say, pointing at the cylinder to distract him from his plush snack. Take off the cap, boy. Beck sadly doesn't understand where you're pointing and rubs his head against your hand. Useless nuclear mutt. There is one room above your own, and a spherical tip to the research complex. The attic. Frankly, you don't go there very much due to your grandpa's uh, creepy paraphernalia, but you have no choice. 
You have just the thing to get that pesky cap off. The attic can only be accessed by a ladder on the side of your bedroom, which means you're going to have to hop out onto the balcony and hastily scramble up. You're not a big fan of heights. You might just casually leap out of windows in your dreams, but this is real life. And as you know, if you die in real life, you die in real life. You manage to reach the attic, still shivering from the height. The attic is a messy place. Your grandpa never had it cleaned while you're alive, and now that he's a stuffed man in the foyer, the place is basically a dust collection. You rummage through the garbage, tossing things out of the way hastily. Beck zaps up behind you, cocking his head curiously. You're looking for a specific tool, one that's sure to get the cap off, but it's so cluttered that it's slow going. In the meantime, you check your phone. Jade, status report. Rose, you can't get on Dave's case for sounding like a Star Trek guy if you're gonna do it yourself. Tell her, J-Dog. Wrong. When I do it, it's cool. Okay, but if I'm John Luke, you're Kirk. Wrong again. I'll gladly shave my head for the role. You can be Riker. Who's Riker? Riker? I hardly know her. <coughs> this is idiotic. Okay, okay. John got the machines in. I'm just looking for something to open my Cruxtruder. This means that once I'm in, we'll have to finish a loop, right? Correct. What happens when a loop is done, anyway? Not sure. I thought you were the one keeping an eye on the forums. I am. No one else has completed a loop yet. Or no one who's reported back, anyway. That's, uh, uh, that's fine, though, right? No, the game doesn't officially begin until the loop is closed. How do you know that if no one's finished a loop? My cat told me. What? Oh, oh, wait, okay, I get you. Is your bird telling you anything? Uh, no. He's just kind of yelling, squawking mostly. Um, what are you guys talking about? You'll find out soon, Jade. For now, don't talk to us. Focus on getting into the game. You don't need to be told twice. Suddenly, in your attic rummaging, you shriek. From underneath one of Grandpa's paintings, a face peeks out. Fuck! You say, clutching your chest. You calm down. It wasn't a living face. It was just the stuffed, taxidermized, dead clone body of yourself that Grandpa kept up here. Normal stuff. Nothing to be scared of, just a stuffed cadaver that looks exactly like you. You're not sure how your grandpa got a stuffed taxidermized corpse of you. You never asked, and frankly, you don't think you want to know the answer. You always figured it had something to do with his research, but even though taxidermizing dead loved ones is normal, the fact that it's you, a living person, strikes you as macabre. Not long after finding your dead stuffed clone, you hit pay dirt. Hey! You wave Beck over, who grabs one end of a long, tanned case in his snout, helping you tug it from the bric-a-brac. You click it open, and from within, you see it. Your tool. Your grandfather's heirloom. Big medicine. An 1895 lever-action rifle. Sadly, in spite of this payload, you have to stop being Jade for a while. My apologies. That's just how it is. For now... You are once again Dave Strider. Now that things have calmed down, the confusion sets in. What the entire fuck is going on here? Orbs? Totems? Machines? Meteors? Madness. Not to mention your bro is currently MIA. Out your window is total blackness, and you're afraid to look outside. For now, you're hunkered in your room as a gargantuan creaking noise is sound outside far away. You're scared and alone, so you do what you've always done. Reach out. Chad, if you're, uh, if you're reading this, I made it. Well, uh, I think I did. It looks like I'm in and we're about to finish the loop. Last I heard, you were trying to do the same. Just, uh, if you see this and you're not dead, beat me. I love you, man. No answer. You switch to something else, checking the forums, like Rose said. Before you can, however, something flaps in your face. The crow that you mercifully brought back to life using the orb earlier is back. And instead of flying away like a normal bird, it's been flying around your room like a brainless, feathery asshole. Fuck off, man, you say, shoving him away. 
Unlike before, he's no longer black, but a robust orange. Perching on your computer, looking at you with his brainless head cocked. Fuck off, man! It repeats obnoxiously, like a parrot. Fuck off, man! This sucks. You do an act of kindness to a bird who died by your hand, and look what it earns you. You swat at it, but it's too quick, hovering above you, landing on your head. Fuck off, man! It says once more. Whatever. You log into VG Facts. Predictably, it's Bedlam. If I don't respond after this, it's over. I don't even know why I'm making my last post in this shithole, but to anyone reading, please, you've got to survive. Blah, blah, blah. This is what you get for releasing this godforsaken game on an unsuspecting public. Let's all hear it for Big Funky J, if that is your real name, for being the biggest sap ever to walk the planet you squishy humans live on. Does anyone have anything constructive? We're all in this together, people. Any information could save lives. I wouldn't bother. You're dead meat anyway. The best thing I would do is just to lay down and die. I hate to agree with anything that dribbles out of your mouth, Vriska, but in this case, you're right. Hello, friends. Please assist. Tried to play game with some cohorts and was disconnected from them. I'm now alone in a mysterious land. Send help. Smells of piss. Ah, uh, God, I can't tell who's a troll and who's not. Have you completed your chain, Effa? Unknown. I will have to drink my own urine to survive. Please don't drink your own urine. It won't have to come to that for some time. I should start early, I feel. Will acclimate me to the taste. Uh, I swear to Christ, if that's the last thing I have to read, I will be so pissed. Status update. The piss is acrid, but I managed. The worst thing is the temperature. We'll investigate cooling solutions and report back. Please, don't. No sign of Chad here either. You're about to start talking to your orange shithead bird for company when a notification appears. Dave. You jolt upright, fingers shaking. Chad, fuck, I've been waiting for you, man. What the hell is going on? Are you in the game? Did you finish your chain? No. I, I don't know what to say. I was supposed to play with Jack and Mike. They never got in. I never even connected. I own to put my machines in, but... They're meteors. I saw some shit. I don't think they're like... I don't think they're around anymore. Fuck. I remember them. Fuck. I don't know what to do, man. I'm not connected. You you guys are almost in, right? Can I connect to you guys? Your heart drops. You swallow thickly, hands shaking too hard to respond. I don't know. Fuck, Chad, we just connected the last person. They're not in yet, but fuck. We, we can get you in, dude. Just, just hang tight, Chad. Heh. <laughs> You lean forward, heart hammering in your chest, palms sweating. It's okay. You're okay. You're in. I'll ask them. I'll figure out a way to open the chain. Fuck. Fuck! Dave. Dude. Calm down. It's not in the cards. You don't know when you started, but your face is wet with tears. I don't know what the hell is going on, man. I don't know how shit got like this. And the way it's shaping up, I don't think I will. No. Chad, come the fuck on. Don't talk like that. Connect, connect to someone on VG. <laughs> fuck off, man. I'm a goner. No. You're not yet. There's still time. Chad! It's over, Dave. You scream at the computer, as if he can hear you. The bird retreats to perch on your broken turntables. I'm just glad these are my last moments, Dave. I love you, man. Stop! It's been real. Shit. What the fuck do I say? Uh, what's a badass line to go out on? Help me workshop this, dude. I've gotta think of something cool. Wait, I've got it. Chad, fuck you, please, I'm begging you. I'll get on my knees in real life, don't fuck around! <laughs> Buskin makes me feel good. Chad! You freeze. Your blood seems to stop as the second you see that message, 
stretches wide to infinity. Time has stopped the moment your friend died. Fuck off, man! The crow shrieks from behind you. Dave is too tired to have you be him anymore. Time to be Jade again. You're Jade Harley. <laughs> Congrats! With big medicine over your shoulder, you carefully climb back down to your room, loading a bullet into the ancient chamber. You hope this baby still shoots. Cocking the pump, you take aim. You've always been a good markswoman, but this gun is old as dirt. The rest of your firearms are downstairs, too far to run and grab. Curse your transportalizer shenanigans. Beck watches curiously. This isn't fetch time, Beck. Beck likes to fetch bullets you shoot across the ocean on sunny days, teleporting out to grab them in his mouth. He whines, but seems to understand. You gaze down the iron sights and yank the trigger. With a bang and a clang, the lid of the Cruxtruder flies off like it's made of plastic, sailing out the window. Loading another bullet reflexively, you sling big medicine over your shoulder to grab the cylinder. As predicted by your friends, an orb emerges from the Cruxtruder as well. Beck barks happily at the orb. Sit, you say hastily. Something rumbles outside, and to your dismay, you see the meteor overhead, lazily taking up half the sky. This meteor looks large too large. This isn't just a destroy a suburb meteor. This might be one on the scale of kills all dinosaurs. Pushing that grim thought back, something else shocks you. The timer that had just read 30 minutes now read a mere two. Dave's timer had changed earlier, but what could have changed yours? Something rumbles again. Oh, fuck. From across the lagoon, on the other side of the crescent-shaped island, you see the peak of the mountain, but to your shock and fear, the summit is glowing red. You learn in this moment that all your life you've lived above an active volcano. Beck, don't mess with that! No time to waste now. You shove the cylinder in the alchemeter and, just like your friend said, something happens. In one second, you see what appears to be a piñata made of green glass. The next, you go blind. Grabbing at your face in irritation, you realize you've been blindfolded. Up until now, each one of your friends has had some puzzle associated with their alchemeter, but this one makes you growl in frustration. From your back, you grab big medicine by the barrel, unwisely using it as a makeshift club. If you don't move, you should be able to estimate where the piñata is. Unfortunately, you don't get far. From the other side of the room, Beck barks and something flashes, cutting him off. In your alarm, you turn to face him, forgetting your eyes are covered by the unmovable blindfold. Beck whines, and your pet owner heart shatters with the sound of his pain. Beck? You forgot your alchemeter, clawing at the blindfold, feeling around for your dog. Beck! You forlornly howl. Sadly, in your haste, you trip, falling backwards towards the balcony door you left open. Stumbling, you fall. The wind rushes around you, and you scream, clinging to big medicine for dear life. You still can't see. You're too high in the air. The fear of heights suddenly realized. You don't know what possesses you in that moment, but you take your gun, leaning back in midair, and you shoot one single bullet. You still can't see, but as you feel the ground knock the air out of your lungs, the blindfold shatters, just in time for you to see the volcano erupt smoke into the sky as you lose consciousness. Somewhere in the distance, a phone rings. It's for you. I'll go ahead and uh, put them on speaker. Good evening. This is your doctor speaking. Sentient creatures love stories. They love hearing them, they love telling them. All of language is organized around them. The simplest statements from go there to I did this are all stories in microscopic form. String enough together and you have something truly compelling. Every time you sit down to tell a co-worker or schoolmate something happened, you're doing it. 
Every time you draw a shitty cartoon in the margins of your homework paper, you're doing it. Every time you sit down in a comfy chair to watch a movie, you're doing it. Podcasts, books, films, legends, fables, poems, songs, web comics. There are so many words and forms we have for this one thing. Stories could be the most important thing of all. On April 13th, 2009, four 18 year olds played a video game, Spurb. Released by a shady baking conglomerate headed by a probably alien multi dimensional being, this game ended the world. The only survivors were those four kids and their four guardians. So the story is over. This one at least. The tale of four kids and their little video game. They all did it. They placed their cruxite into their alchemeters and used their entry items to get into the world of Spurb, escaping death by meteor. The end. Finito. Enda. But that can't be it, can it? After all, what's inside this mysterious game? Who are the trolls plaguing these poor teens? And who the hell is Betty Crocker? Who's to say? In the dusty garage of a formerly Seattle suburban home, a man gawks into the driveway. Where once had been his neighborhood was now an empty abyss. Jonathan Egbert walks to the edge of his garage, dumbfounded, looking down a steep cliff face into dark gray clouds below. His house seems to have been transplanted, removed from its quiet Washington street, and placed atop this cliff. Why? How? Jonathan didn't know. He raised his voice to call for his son. John, come down! Before Jonathan can speak these words, however, an oily hand clasps over his mouth, muffling him as he is dragged away. In a forlorn basement, Roxanne Lalonde snoozes by a computer monitor, with countless dots covering a map of the United States. She'd known all her life that April 13th would be the end of her world, but she didn't know she'd be ringing it in by being asleep. Cat food piles in a corner. Blinking, Roxanne awakens, head thrumming with the familiar sensation of a hangover. She's had so many in her life that the throbbing barely registers with her. She smacks her lips, spitting on the concrete floor, shoving a martini glass off the table. She emerges from her lab's secret entrance and winces, a shaft of light cutting the doorway, and her own eyes like a knife to her skull. All right, now she's feeling that hangover. She stumbles outside and hears the rushing of water. Her home, too, has been transplanted from a New York forest to a bright land of painfully bright light and pastel-colored water, an island in its midst. She slinks back down to the lab to build a boat. In a formerly Texan apartment, Derek Strider sighs, sewing a patch onto a puppet's arm. Lil' Cal was injured in the kerfuffle earlier. We're in the shits now, little Cal, Bro says, regarding the smug grin of the puppet with a forlorn visage. The puppet naturally doesn't respond. It's a fucking puppet. Derek also knew the end of the world, always believing his adopted son would be the chosen hero to beat it back. He'd assumed Dave would someday save the day, but as the years progressed, Derek was disappointed to find his son was hardly a hero at all. From his workbench, he produced his magnum opus. Not a puppet, but a skateboard with attached rocket boosters. One that, unlike the prototype that had blown up his meteor, worked as intended. Derek looked out the window. All around the apartment building was a sea of lava, hot and bubbling. He didn't know where he was, but he wasn't going to stick around to find out. Derek was going to take matters into his own hands. Dave, he said sternly, opening the door to his apartment proper. And finally Beck, the last guardian, loyal pooch and beloved pet, was nosing Jade Harley's inert body, which now, even though this was a tropical island, had snow falling on it. Four homes, four places they'd been moved to. The end of this story has come and gone, but not to worry. More is to come. Much more, in fact. For now, for being such a good patient and excellent listener, how about a treat? 
A new story, a fresh one, a small one, here at the end of this act. Stuck Alternate Universe is written by Funk McLovin. Act 1 Art is by James Webb Comics. Voice acting is done primarily by Bucky, Alter Universe Wash, aka Janaya, and articulately composed. A special thanks to the current VFP patrons, Sousa Brees, Kaleidoscope Mediator, and Elizabeth. Subscribe to patreon.com slash funk to get early access to episodes downloadable episodes and behind the scenes content including music and podcasts and don't forget to check us out on archive of our own and mspfa special thanks to andrew hussey for writing homestuck and thank you for watching A wayward vagabond wanders the desolate sands of a long dead planet, making a dotted line of tracks, stretching out miles behind him, the sun beating down from above. The only relief from the rays are his tattered garb, once a symbol of his rebellion, now sun-bleached and dusty. In the distance, Our hero sees a hatch. The wayward vagabond's pace picks up. It feels like he's cooking inside his carapace, and finds himself longing for the cool, dusky streets of his old city home. His black, shining skin isn't fit for the desert sun. The hatch is pure white, and turns, groaning as the vagabond pulls it open. Instantly, relief finds him as the sun dies away. Beneath the hatch is a ladder, down which our vagabond climbs into the dimly lit recess below. Eyes adjusting, the vagabond squints. His assessment of the space is that of some kind of lab. He's never been one for science himself, but any place out of the blazing sun is fine by him. Curiously, and with nothing better to do, he traipses inside. Within is a smallish room, outfitted with panels, dials, and screens foreign to him. The room is dominated by a massive console, with a keyboard attached, with four screens arranged oddly. One screen, to his surprise, is lit. On the screen the vagabond sees... well, he's not quite sure what he sees. He thinks it's some kind of boy. Approaching the keyboard, he types. Maybe this boy can hear him. Boy, he types. No response. Answer me, boy, he types. The boy looks confused, but other than this, he is motionless. The boy appears to be doing battle with imps. Curious. The vagabond slides down his hood, looking around the room in earnest. (gasps) What luck! Inside of a panel on the wall, there are dozens of cans, each labeled to his delight with a different foodstuff. And, even luckier, deeper in the panel... No. Can it be? The vagabond's face lights up. Tab! Yes! Fucking score! Those pink cans of fizzy beverage never looked so wonderful to him. He greedily takes a can from the alcove and cracks it open. He's never been so happy to hear the hiss of carbonation. It's warm, but the vagabond hardly cares. He tilts the can back, sipping lustfully. But he can't stop at one, oh no. 
Before long, cans of tab dot the floor, the vagabond sloshing with the fizzy drink. He leans on the wall and sits. A feast for a king, not a shred of remorse. It strikes him that perhaps this tab belonged to the owner of the lab, but he wisely reasons that if these chumps didn't want their tab stolen, they should have locked that shit down. The vagabond looks back up at the screen. The boy is still faffing about pointlessly. Is this some form of uh, entertainment? Sloshing to his feet, the vagabond carries himself to the console again, trying once more to type. You know what? You're now the wayward vagabond. You deserve it. Are you a boy or a girl? You type. You can't tell from this distance, really. Answer me! This question seems to register something with the screen child. Unfortunately, it seems to aggravate him. Them? Her? She, he, they, it clutches her, his, their, its head angrily. Never mind, you hastily type. This seems to calm it, she, they, he down. What a touchy person. What are you doing? You ask. This also seems to aggravate the child to a lesser degree. It appears your words are getting beamed into his very head on a sub subconscious level. No use trying to establish communique then. Best just to give some helpful suggestions. Open tab, you helpfully suggest. The on-screen child recoils in disgust, but he walks back into what appears to be his domicile, checking a large trunk containing food items. No, you insist as he withdraws a metallic pouch reading Capri Sun. Tab, you irritably hit the enter several more times, but this just confuses your new friend. What a bozo. Doesn't even have tab in the hunger trunk. You decide to ignore this frivolous child of indeterminate gender. This place is pretty nice. Maybe you'll live here from now on. Eke out a life living on the fat of the land in an abandoned lab. The fat of the land, in this case, being the cans in the alcove. You yawn. You've been walking for a long time, and you're pretty tired. Still, you probably shouldn't fall asleep in case of the vengeful tab owner's return. To protect against potential aggressors, you search the room for a weapon to fashion. The best you can find is a rusty shard taped to a yardstick. This ought to be decent for poking. You're used to using improvised weapons from your days after the war, after all. You take some stray cables and fashion a sheath of sorts, doubling as a sash. Oh, this brings you back. You used to wear a sash. Granted, not one made of cables, but still, it's nostalgic. You tear the label from a mayo can and stick it to your sash, using some chalk inside the alcove to add the letter R to the label. Yes, haha. <laughs> You're the mayor. That's right, the mayor of Cantown. A wonderful, bustling metropolis of tin and vigor. You snap out of your ridiculous shenanigans when you hear the hatch above you squeak. Oh, fuck. Looks like the tab owner is back. You grip your mighty spear, not just the shitty yardstick, and prepare for battle. Down the ladder comes a tall, white figure. You're a pretty short fella yourself, but that doesn't scare you. Uh, hello? A voice calls. It's nervous and wary, but it also seems rather tired. The voice of someone whose soul has been crushed by some back-breaking labor. Hello? You respond tentatively. Friend or foe? You demand. What? The voice sounds even more tired. It enters the lab room and you get a good look. Friend or foe? You repeat. The white-shelled woman groans. What am I supposed to say? Foe? Friend, put down the yardstick. Well, now you feel foolish. You hesitantly drop the spear, sensing no danger from this beleaguered woman. Who are you? You demand, trying to regain authority. I'm the post minister, she says, then corrects herself. Well, now I'm not anything. I got fired, I guess. That's rough, you admit. On my third day, too, she says miserably, looking around. It appears the lab is new to her, too. Do you live here? She asks. You nod, but you only nod tentatively. As of uh, recently, you say, guarded. It's... You see the postminister struggle to find a compliment. When it fails, she admits, 
<sighs> Shitty. I suppose, you admit. You don't know why you're being defensive. You literally just got here. Are you from Durs? She asks. Well, I guess that's obvious. I'm from Prospit. Are you... She looks at your sash. A mayor? Uh, oh! You hastily stow your spear, adjusting your sash proudly. No, it's an honorary title, bestowed upon me by the residents of Cantown. Okay, she says. Her tone seems unimpressed with makes you deflate. Who's that? She asks, pointing at the screen. Ah! You say in a stentorian voice, waving at the screen with your hand. That is my collaborator. I correspond with them and assist them with important decisions. Okay, she says again, still unenthused. She takes a closer look, squinting at the screen. That looks like someone I know, she says. Really? You say, inching closer. Yes, the heir of breath, one of our dreamers. You have dreamers on Durst too, right? Indeed, you say, looking closer. I thought the heir was a woman, you say. Maybe this is her brother, she reasons. You seem sharp, Miss Former Minister, you say, hands on your hips. How would you like to be appointed my own honorary postmistress? The white woman seems to scowl. I don't know. I do love the mail, but my post days are over. These days I'm but a peregrine mendicant. That's a depressing title, you say. So is being the mayor of nothing, she retorts. It's not cruel, it's just matter of fact. You sigh. Looks like this is your new roommate, even though she seems kind of like a downer. No matter, it's been ages since you've seen anyone. Where are we? You ask. Earth, she says simply. A planet called that, according to what I found. Earth, you repeat thoughtfully. Sounds boring. Your mendicant roommate shrugs. It was destroyed years in the past, but not many, or so I'm told. Exiles from Prospet and Durs are sent here to wander forever. Looks like that's our fate, you say solemnly. It's not so bad, I suppose. We have mayo, after all. According to what I found, the place used to be inhabited. But a while ago, meteors struck it and killed everything. Sometimes, stray meteors still hit the sand. They say portals come from the sky and deposit them. That sounds like Skya, you say, to which she nods. How did you get exiled? Prospidian interloper asks. You lean on the wall and swallow. She senses this is a sensitive topic for you, but doesn't rescind her question. I was a revolutionary, you say. I started war against the kings. Oh, she says. That was foolish. How did you get here, then? You quickly change the topic. I couldn't deliver a message, she shrugs. I don't think it was possible to begin with. You cross your arms. That seems pretty harsh to you, and she seems to sympathize with your revolutionary sentiments. No one really likes the monarchs. Maybe you two have more in common than you thought. You try to smile at her, but your grimace only makes her cringe in disgust. No matter. Everything's dead now, she shrugs. You figure she's right. No use mourning strangers, you reason. You both snap from your stupor, however, as you hear the hatch above turn again. Another friend? The mendicant asks, but falls silent as she sees you draw your mighty spear. Possibly, you say, hissing quietly as carapace feet descend the stairs. Or possibly a foe. You are no longer the wayward vagabond. You are now Jacob Harley. The year is 1991, a banner year indeed for you. For you, Jacob Harley, globetrotting scientist, stud, and star of the hit television program, Jacob's World, have made two life-changing acquisitions. The first, a massive island off the coast of Hawaii that is home to a set of ruins just aching for the plundering. Oop, you mean exploration. The second, more curiously, a baby. A baby that had, upon your arrival to the island, fallen from the sky riding upon a meteor. But hey, you're not one to look a gift horse in the gob, are you? Even if the meteor this particular baby was piloting did smash into the boat you'd used to get here. Not ideal. Luckily for you, you'd sent ahead for a base camp to be set up on the island, giving you and your new baby shelter for the night. Well, aren't you a handsome thing? 
you say, admiring the baby with a twinkle in your eye. It coos at you and gazes up with those deep green eyes. You've never been one for kids yourself, but how hard can raising this little scamp be? So now, you say, leaning in in case the baby can understand you. You're not from the planet Krypton, are you? Oh, <laughs> just asking. Here, can you bend this in half? Testing to see if the baby you found is indeed Superman, you place the baby on a large steel I-beam that the construction crew left after building your home. The baby whines, patting its hands on the I-beam. Drat, you say, snapping your fingers. Worth a shot. Uh, I guess you're just a run-of-the-mill humdrum garden variety bog standard sky baby. How boring. You place the boring baby back on the table. You've fashioned a pair of diapers for it and a shirt you've tore up, but you seriously hope it doesn't shit all over them. Maybe you lucked out and got a non-shitting baby. I shall call you Jade, you announce. The baby blinks those eyes. For your eyes are the loveliest jade green, aren't they? Mm, yes, they are. You coo at the baby like you've seen your ex-wives do before. See, this baby business would be easy. Wouldn't you know it, Jade? But I myself came from the sky. Myself and my sister, that is. You pick Jade up, carrying her to the kitchen. Easy, Beck, you say jovially as your dog leaps up and tries to sniff the bundle you have in your hands. You place little Jade into Beck's dog carrier, lacking any crib or secure playpen as of yet. Beck whines, seeming somewhat dubious. Oh, don't look at me like that, boy. There's blankets in there, see? And some, uh, toys. By toys, of course, you're referring to the spent pistol casings which Jade is now gnawing on. See? She loves them. Beck looks at you. Green electricity, crackling on its fur. Beckroll Harley, your trusted pooch companion. You've had him since long as you can remember, a gift from your grandmother, a grandmother you absolutely despise. Beck was the only nice thing that witch Betty Crocker ever did for you. He's a bit odd as dogs go, but he's loyal as can be. You watch little Jade here while I pop off to the ruins, boy. You say, petting Beck's fur. <laughs> Shouldering your rifle, you set off towards the lagoon. By trade, you're an entertainer, but your true passion and field of study is archaeology, a field which has summarily rejected you over the years. Countless colleagues have looked down on your total and utter disrespect for artifacts and their namby-pamby rules. They might enjoy playing in the dirt to find pottery, but you, on the other hand, have different methods. Methods you can employ now, walking boldly into the maw of the ruins, holding a torch in one hand and a gun in the other. You can't just go on island and tromp around in some ruins like Indiana Jones, you say, mockingly repeating the words your college said to you. Ha! Shows them. The frog ruins, as they've come to be known, were discovered in 1954, the very year of your birth, by your own grandmother, Betty Crocker. What that old oven jockey hag was digging up in these ruins is beyond you, but it appears that back then she'd been looking for them for some time. Whatever she'd been looking for, she never told you, but it drove you mad for years. She told you you are never allowed to set foot on that island, and, as everyone knows, parents telling you not to do something was a surefire way to get you to do that thing. You'd begged and pleaded others to take you to the island just to spite the witch and visit, but no one would. It was only through amassing a fortune as a TV star on National Geographic that you'd been able to make enough money to come yourself. And now that you're here, inside the ruins your grandmother had forbidden you from entering, well, truth be told, it's kind of a letdown. After a simple walk down a corridor, you find yourself in a room. Just a room. One single room. The room is cavernous, a large flower blooming in the middle of it with various stone carvings and platforms dotted around. No pottery, no books, no, no anything. Just a bunch of junk. There has to be a secret to this place, you decide, and with your torch you set about searching the frog ruins. You slide your hands over the walls carefully, searching for indentations and secret compartments, but you find none as you search clockwise. Looks like whatever was down here was plundered by dear grandma all those decades ago. What a fucking ripoff. You inspect one of the pedestals on the floor. Oddly, it looks metallic, even though the ruins date back to before the Stone Age. You kick one with your foot, dust exploding from it dramatically from the jolt. Odder still, there's a plaque on the wall above the pedestal that reads, The Land of Wind and Shade. What is this, Alice in Wonderland? You scoff aloud. Did Gramla put these here? That didn't seem right. She was never into esoterica like this, but on the other hand, this architecture wasn't modern. Or maybe, not of this world. You step on the pedestal. All of a sudden, like a stun grenade going off, your vision goes white and you hear a ringing deep inside your ears. 
You double over and fall forward, expecting to feel the hard stone ruins under your hands, but you don't. Under your hands is grass, and above you the sky is dark gray and dotted with tiny lights. What in the blue blazes? you cry, instinctively reaching for big medicine. Around you is a forest, but none like you've ever seen upon the earth. The bark of the trees is ash gray, and the leaves are navy blue, just like the grass. You look behind you. This is Alice in Wonderland, you hiss, eyes narrowing. Are you lost? says a voice from behind you. You whirl around, brandishing your gun at the voice, but to your surprise, it's a person. Not a human person, but clearly a person. Clad in gold robes with bright white hard-looking skin, gazing up at you with frightened eyes. Who are you? You demand through your bristling mustache. I'm Miss Paint, says the person thing, raising her hands defensively. Is that a gun? Of course it's a bloody gun, you say, incredulous. It's a point four oh five Winchester, circa 1885. Oh, says Miss Paint. You roll your eyes. Now you're sure this is a woman, since she doesn't understand guns. And of course I'm lost. I come from Earth, see? Earth. Where am I now? Some space alien planet? You're on the land of wind and shade, Miss Paint says worriedly. But you can't go back to Earth. Earth was destroyed, wasn't it? That's why we send exiles. There's nothing there but wasteland. Earth isn't destroyed. It's perfectly fine, you think for a moment. You must be thinking of a different Earth. Oh, Miss Paint says again. Well, either way, sir, I can help you get back. She bites her lip. You lower your weapon, pinching the bridge of your nose. <sighs> Let me guess, you say tiredly. You need me to do something for you first. Miss Paint nods solemnly. You are no longer Jacob Harley. We stand so 